early on an early winter morning here. And uh, we are very happy because uh, this is a very important uh, event that uh, where I am hoping that we further deepen Japan-India ties. And uh, to tell you a little brief about the event, uh, this is the envisioning the strengthening and consolidation of Japan-India ties in multiple spheres, uh, not just now, but in the decades ahead. This year, uh, 2022, we are celebrating the 70th year of the uh, establishment of diplomatic ties between Japan and India. And we are looking ahead for the centenary of this, 30 years ahead. How much more deep our friendship, our ties, our exchanges, our partnerships and uh, global assistance to each other will happen in the year 2052. Hence the title of the symposium, Japan-India Synergy Vision 2052. So we are looking at a lot of areas where we have global strategic partnership, economy, trade, Japanese grants assistance, connectivity. We all know about the Delhi Metro, how the Japanese have assisted us there. And now we'll also be having the Shinkansen, the bullet train. And uh, then we have urban planning, the sister city projects. Uh, for example, Varanasi and the sister city is Kyoto. Uh, Kyoto is absolutely beautiful and they are doing a lot to maintain the integrity of the heritage of that city and hopefully we'll be able to do the same in Varanasi and other country, uh, other cities. And then of course environment and climate change, a subject which is very close to my heart. And lastly, but not the least, art and culture. Well, I'm an artist really, so that is of course the closest to my heart, that subject. And Japan is replete with art and culture, and uh, so is India. Uh, but uh, we have to strive a little more to take it to the Japanese perspective where they uh, even uh, people, not just um, their artifacts, their sculptures, their gardens, but even people and even trees are declared as national uh, important cultural objects, even trees, people, of course. So how much they appreciate that heritage. So this is something we have to learn a little bit more from them. Uh, in the morning session is virtual. We have four speakers from Japan, uh, Dr. Hajime Hasegawa, he's professor of media studies from Gakuen University, Tokyo. He'll be speaking on uh, an area of manga. Manga is like Japanese animation. And in this case, he's taking the case study of uh, how uh, inspired by an Indian uh, tale. And then we have... Uh, 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 Yoko Nanka Matsushita, uh, she is actually a Bharatanatyam dancer. She studied in Chennai with the uh, guru and uh, for many, very many years she speaks very good Sanskrit. So she's quite amazing that way. And then we have Mr. Tokyo Hasegawa who's uh, established a museum in uh, his hometown of Taka Tokamachi, which is in Niigata Prefecture. And this he calls the Mithila Museum. He's the founder director. So he'll be showing us images from there. Then uh, in the next session, we'll be having uh, Dr. Vibha Dhawan, the Director General of Terry. Uh, so uh, hopefully she'll be talking on environment and climate change. And uh, then we'll be having Dr. Hajime uh, Hasegawa. He's from, uh, oh, sorry, uh, he, he, uh, he's not in the first session. He's in the second session, I'm sorry. And uh, then we have, uh, no. Okay, so, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Prabhakar, who will be joining us from Bangalore. And then uh, Dr. Satoru Nagao, he's a non-resident fellow of Hudson Institute, uh, Washington, D.C., but he'll be joining from Tokyo. So, uh, I won't say more. I'll request our director, uh, Dr. Mr. K. N. Srivastava, to give his welcome address. And by the way, we are very thankful to Mr. Srivastava. It's because of him all this is happening. He's given the go-ahead. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anu. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste to all my Indian friends who are uh, present here and also joining online. And konnichiwa to our friends who are joining uh, from Japan. Uh, 
at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate and thank uh, Dr. Anu Jindal for uh, organizing uh, this uh, uh, program, Japan-India Synergy. Uh, as we all know, uh, he is a well-renowned uh, artist, uh, scholar, and curator. And uh, if I call her as a culture ambassador of India to Japan, it would not be an exaggeration. Uh, I would like to uh, just uh, uh, start by saying that uh, our center has got an umbilical link with uh, Japan. You may be aware that uh, this has been model, modeled on the pattern of uh, International House of Japan, Tokyo. And uh, right since inception, we have been having, uh, you know, uh, a collaborative partnership uh, with them. We have renewed our uh, MOU with them uh, this year. So as a part of MOU, several exchange programs are going to take place between our two uh, countries and uh, institutions. Uh, as uh, Anu has mentioned that this year is very special uh, for uh, all of us for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that India International Center is celebrating its uh, Diamond Jubilee. Uh, then 70th year of uh, Indo-Japanese uh, diplomatic relation also we are celebrating and uh, incidentally this year also is an important year uh, i think uh, 75th year of uh, uh, of uh, international house of japan uh, is also being celebrated uh, uh, you know in this year so from that viewpoint uh, it's a very important year for us uh, we as a part of our diamond jubilee celebrations have uh, have uh, started several programs uh, under uh, various identified you know cluster subjects uh, President of India had, uh, you know, inaugurated uh, the celebrations and uh, we'll be concluding this one sometimes in uh, uh, March next year. So far, our Japan and India, you know, partnership is concerned. She has already mentioned uh, a little bit, but I would like to further elaborate because I have been associated with various projects, you know, uh, which were, you know, financially and technically supported by uh, uh, Japan. Uh, I was a managing director of uh, Bangalore Metro Rail Corporation and uh, there uh, we were seeking some external funding. We explored various, you know, multilateral agencies, you know, for funding. But finally, we found that the terms, conditions, you know, put forth and offered by JICA was the best. And consequently, we decided to take funds from them besides, of course, mobilizing funds from our uh, Indian, you know, financial institutions. And I'm very happy to uh, report that like uh, Delhi Metro, even Bangalore Metro has also benefited a lot, uh, you know, with the uh, Japanese, you know, participation in our project. Another project which I'd like to recall since I come from the city of Bangalore is that uh, Japan has been very, very helpful and uh, supportive uh, in uh, water supply schemes of Bangalore city. As you know, it's a very, very expensive scheme because we have to bring water all the way from Kaveri River. But uh, Japanese, uh, you know, JICA and, uh, you know, the entire team, they have been very, uh, you know, helpful in not only, uh, uh, you know, providing funds, but also in providing, you know, technical assistance. So the list is very long. I can keep on in enumerating several things. But since these two were the projects with which I was personally associated, I thought that it would be important for me to recall. Uh, so far, the cultural ties between our two countries are concerned. It is well known that uh, there's a lot of similarity in our culture, the family values, uh, the entire, you know, I mean, uh, cultural traditions, uh, you know, are quite similar. Uh, the way we worship uh, the nature is also, you know, similar. So uh, that way, it is always a great pleasure and honor for uh, all of us to associate with Japan uh, in all fields, uh, including culture and uh, uh, you know, project management, etc. cetera. Uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, India, uh, Japan Synergy, uh, you know, Vision 2052, uh, Anu has uh, drafted out a very nice, you know, kind of, you know, program details here. Uh, all important subjects are being covered, be it cultural, be it, you know, project related, be it uh, technical. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, all of us are going to really get benefited with the deliberations that are going to take place uh, today. I'm very happy to uh, note that uh, several eminent you know, scholars from Japan are you know, joining us uh, in this uh, uh, program. And uh, we are definitely going to get hugely benefited uh, with, their, with their, their deliberations and uh, uh, you know, uh, discourse. 
I would not like to say much uh, on this occasion, uh, except that I would like to thank everybody you know, who has been associated directly or indirectly with this program and particularly to Anu. I'm very uh, sorry to mention here that uh, she has a uh, bereavement in her family uh, and uh, she would not be available to us uh, throughout uh, this program. She had to leave early, but uh, uh, her endeavor, you know, uh, her effort, you know, in putting this program uh, in shape and uh, execution is definitely laudable. And uh, I look forward uh, as a director of uh, India International Center that through her uh, ages, we would be having more and more such uh, collaborative, you know, symposiums, programs, seminars, etc. in years ahead. Our endeavor would be to strengthen our, uh, you know, ties with Japan in every field of our uh, social life and activities. So with these few words, I end here. I once again congratulate everybody, you know, for uh, putting this program uh, in, uh, in shape and uh, uh, getting it, you know, organized over here. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request uh, Ms. Yoko Matsuta from uh, Osaka? She'll be uh, uh, starting the program in a traditional Indian way of uh, reciting an invocation in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. She's a Bharatnatyam dancer who studied for many years in Chennai, and she's going to do it in Sanskrit. Uh, Yoko san, please. Yes. <laughs> Tandu Mahasak to be Kansiban Guru Brahmara Guru Vishnuhu Guru Devo Maheshara Guru Saksha Para Brahmara Tasmai Shuri Urabe Namaha Buddhi Baranya Shodeya Niruaya Tra Rogata Ayadan Waktakuancha Hanumato Sumarana Babe Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, now, may I t ask our chairperson for this session, Mr. Kojiro Morikawa, to take over. To Mr. Morikawa is a historian. He's a member of Osaka Foreign Business Network Club and an investor. And he's joining us from Kyoto, Japan. And Mr. Morikawa, may I also request you to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, and please take over now. Now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I think you're mute. Koji-san, maybe you're mute. Can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Anu, uh, my name is Kojiro Morikawa. I used to study England um, imperial history uh, under supervision of my uh, Professor Porter. So uh, just a little in, uh, introduction. I have to um, you know, proceed uh, this meeting. So let me start, uh, say uh, good morning and good afternoon and greetings from Kyoto. I'm Kojiro Morikawa, again, uh, the chairperson of the plenary session of this symposium. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to perform this duty. I hope this symposium will serve its purpose of bringing forth news, new ideas uh, for deepening of the ties and friendship between Japan and India. There are three speakers in this session. Mr. Tokio Hasegawa uh, from Niigata and Ms. Yoko Matsushita from Osaka and Dr. Uh, Prabhakar um, who joined from Bangalore, India to give brief introduction of each speaker. Uh, Mr. Tokio Hasegawa is a founder a director of Mitira Museum located in Tokamachi in Niigata Prefecture, where he lives. And Mr. Hasegawa also describes himself as an urban guard artist. His deep 
interest in Japan, India, friendship shows in his active participation as an executive committee member and representative at Namaste India. He's also representative at NPO Japan India Exchange Association to promote Indo Japan cultural relations. Mr. Hasegawa's presentation is a brief introduction of Mitira Museum at Museum Modern Art Wakayama. He will tell us how he founded the museum and show photos of, of the ex exhibition venue. Yuka-san from Abagasaki, Osaka, will be very kindly acting interpreter. interpreter. Our second speaker is Ms. Yoko Matsita. She's a Bharat Natyam dancer, a Kanari Payatu martial arts practitioner and a yoga instructor. She's disciple of Padam Bhushan awardee, Ms. Mr. Shibui, a Chandra Sekar, and Mrs. Jaya, uh, Chandra Sekar, since 1994. She's undergoing training regularly during her yearly visit to Chennai. Um, um, she has performed in Japan, Chennai, and Canada. She invited guru musicians and dancers from uh, India and uh, performed with them in Japan. She's learning Kanari uh, Prayatu at Shaji School of Kanari um, Prayatu in Chennai and learning online three bad, uh, uh, baga, bad, baga bad, uh, guitar at Gita Pariwo. She's founder director of studio Prachi in Osaka. Matsuhita san's presentation is my journey of dance, kalari, yoga, gita, and the situation of India culture in Japan. Our third speaker is Dr. Echen uh, Prabhakar, who has been teaching since 1985 in the Center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She did her advanced studies, research, and postdoctoral from Tokyo University of Tokyo and Waseda University, Tokyo. She has been visiting foreign researcher in many Japanese universities. Um, he has had many presentations and publications on Japan-India relations. He has re received the, the Japan Foundation Fellowship and has been affiliated to the Institute of Asia Pacific Studies. Waseda University, Tokyo. Dr. Prabhakar is a familiar commentator in modern uh, in Indian media, uh, both visual and print on contemporary Japanese East Asian affairs. Uh, presently, is visiting professor, Department of History, University of Mysore, Mysore. So Dr. Um, Prabhakar uh, will be speaking on India-Japan economic relations, select aspects. Now I invite our first speaker, Mr. Tokyo Hasegawa to make his presentation. Please, Mr. Hasegawa, go ahead. Thank you so much. So, uh, can you listen my sound? 
Yes. Okay. So I, I'm not so good to English. So uh, you can will help me. <laughs> so, so I'm a uh, artist, urban to God. Urban to God, maybe people doesn't know, but maybe uh, some people know uh, uh, Yoko Ono. So Yoko Ono is uh, uh, my friend Kosugi Takesa. We are making uh, uh, some music group uh, 50 years ago. At that time, uh, Kosugi Takesa Majan with Ono Yoko. And uh, Ono Yoko uh, first uh, husband is uh, uh, met uh, John Cage. So John Cage is the uh, most representative of 20th century modern music. But he became to be old. Then the, he called my friend, Kosugi. Then the Kosugi uh, uh, helped for Mass Cunningham's uh, uh, modern dance. And then uh, he was very uh, famous. And then he died uh, three or four years ago. But Mr. Hasegawa doesn't want to go to New York. Why? Because uh, I'm a 14th generation of Tokyo downtown. So uh, I'm influenced from Edo period. So now uh, Japan, uh, 160 or uh, 70 years uh, after open the country. So uh, we are not to get a uh, uh, colony, but also culture is like a colony. So I feel like that because of four, 14 generation of Tokyo downtown. So now uh, at uh, 50 years back, at that time, Japan, Japan is the second uh, economic country in the world. So now we had to better not following uh, Western cultures. We had to better from our fundamental culture uh, uh, to uh, influence and uh, to make a new art. Like uh, uh, Onoyoko, John Lennon, uh, they marriage and they uh, West, West John Lennon and East Onoyoko, then mixed, then the one famous music was coming because uh, imagine. So like that, uh, but uh, Onoyoko living in New York because uh, such a avant-garde music or art, very difficult in Japan because so much uh, uh, going to West. So, but uh, I doesn't want to go to New York. I want make our fundamental Japanese culture to do. So then I uh, live in mountain because uh, there are very old tradition is there. So I learned so many. Then uh, after seven years, uh, development ca coming. So I against, please don't touch nature. Here is so nice. So then the, instead of development, I used to uh, uh, old, old school uh, for museum. Uh, at that time I met Ganga Devi. So I felt Ganga Devi san is like a Picasso. But uh, in India, and uh, of course, recognize such a uh, art about uh, Ganga Devi, but uh, not to keeping for futures. So I felt after Moda dies in Japan, we lost Ukiyo-e. We cannot make uh, now National Ukiyo-e Museum. 
So I thought maybe India also same way. So then the, even if a small school museum, but if we kept keep for such a beautiful art for 10 years, five, 20 years, then in the world maybe recognize our museum. So I started. Then now 40 years. So 40 years I saw moon because moon is most beautiful. For that reason, uh, uh, Wakayama Museum, I made uh, music and also uh, I made uh, one art, this one. So Yuka-san, can, can you translate? Kore wakarimasu ka? Tsukiyake dome cream. No, o ireru utsuwa. Yuka-san, can you translate? Okay. This is a cream to stop uh, tan, moon tan. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, uh, very beautiful. But uh, these things, you know, mixed culture and also fundamental Japanese culture and uh, fundamental Indian culture. Because uh, if we don't use for this cream, then I became to be like a, uh, like a Shiva god or a Krishna god. Because uh, you see, Shiva is a, a Kailasi mountain. Every day, two days moon. So beautiful moon. So then the, his face became to be blue. You know? So Krishna also, every full moon time, uh, he is uh, like to dance. So then the Krishna face also uh, blue color. You know, this uh, secret philosophy. So this is a uh, mixed culture, not only uh, philosophy, not on, only deep religion, uh, but also enjoying with, you know, all the world. So, so then the, uh, uh, recently, still now we, we are doing 20, 25 December, till 25 December, we are doing exhibition. So uh, maybe uh, exhibition, I can uh, show you by helped by in Indian uh, volunteer. So uh, may I see? Then there's something I talk. Exhibition picture possible? Uh, anu san, possible desu ka? Yeah, anu san. Uh, can you uh, can uh, actually? You give uh, um, no, uh, Tokyo Slide. san, your, your slides were too large. They are not opening here. You'll have to manage oh. from there. The file sizes were too large. They were not uh, opening. I see. Oh, okay. So, in that case, I, I will show you my uh, no, iPad. iPad. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like this. So, uh, this also moved by. A young artist from Warri Painters. Oh. Yes. So it, it was uh, something small collaboration. So yeah. I requested, uh, please uh, not to light too much like mm -hmm. a Warri painting, only moon. Mm -hmm. If you like paint more, only small, uh, uh, star or something like that. Then they, he is a modern artist, so he agree or he also thinking like that. So it was a very successful one. So uh, this one, 
uh, uh, in my museum inside and snow, snow time is four meter snow. So spring time, it was very beautiful. Snow time again. Snow life is like that. Uh, when Ganga Devi san coming, uh, when we started 1982, at that time uh, she came and she painted Ganga Devi pictures. And uh, uh, Warri painter challenge. So right side uh, uh, poster, Jibuya Soma Mache. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost uh, exhibition is like that, very modern art museum, very beautiful museum and beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. So first, Godawari Data. Left side Trishura, uh, she came six months to stay. Then the, she she painted only half picture of Trishura. And right side Chakra, uh, Vishnu have a weapon. Uh, I requested only weapon, please uh, this side. So she said, no, 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 this, this uh, this time uh, we cannot finish. But uh, I said, no necessary <laughs> this year. When you come again, then please paint. So uh, right side picture is the last picture of Ganga Devi. Uh, it was not, not finished, then go back India and he got uh, something blood, uh, problem, and uh, uh, kind of concerned with uh, gun, uh, something like cancer, that. Cancer, cancer. Yeah. So then the uh, she died. Right side is the last one picture. So uh, 1989, Pompidou. Uh, Martin, uh, director, uh, called from in the world uh, 100 uh, artists. So uh, 50 artists, uh, modern country, 50 artists, developed country. So from India, uh, Boa Devi and Jibuya Soma Mashe Warudi and Jangar Shin, Gondo uh, <coughs> Pictures. Uh, three person invited. So uh, Boa Devi san is a very artist. And uh, he she got uh, Padma Padma Shuri maybe uh, two or three years back. But I heard still she is a very uh, difficult life. So for for that reason I I was on uh, this seminar because uh, I want to explain how this picture is so nice, but uh, uh, not so, so much people recognize, uh, not only India, in the world. So I'm fighting in the world. So left side, very important uh, picture. She doesn't paint, uh, she doesn't write uh, her name, Jamuna Devi. Such a person uh, make uh, like, uh, like uh, my, so like that. Maybe uh, she doesn't know how to write her name. 
Jamuna Devi. Jamuna Devi. Uh, maybe she doesn't know how to write. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. she cannot write uh, her uh, name. That's right. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah. central terracotta is very important uh, from Impal. Uh, Niramani Devi. Niramani Devi uh, maybe uh, five most important uh, folk artists in India. But uh, I I visit uh, Impar several times, but uh, no nobody cares still. So uh, her her terracotta uh, uh, about thirty collection National Cross Museum have, but uh, another nothing. So when she uh, came to Mitra Museum and only three months and with uh, her daughter and uh, baby. And uh, they made about 300 terracotta, small one and uh, big one. So this is uh, still we kept take care of. So maybe in future, uh, National Cross Museum, 30 piece, and uh, Mr. Hasegawa's piece together, then um, the, uh, it will be very nice. And this yes. is uh, Jibuya Soma Mashe. Uh, Mr. Hasegawa? Yes. Can you hear my voice? At the now, time is quite limited. Okay. So thank you. please finish. I thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, I, my message, most important, is moon. Okay. <laughs> For future. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now um, I invite Ms. Yoko Masita to make her presentation. Please go ahead. Yes. Namaskara. My name is Yoko Masita. First, I would like to thank the uh, Shirimati Anuji and Indian International Center IIC. Thank you so much for giving me such a nice opportunity. I'm really appreciated. And then I think I should say apologize all of you because my English is not perfect. <laughs> I'm very poor about language, but Muja Hindi Kuchati He, Lekin Meri Hindi Bi Kacha Hindi He. So, Virgul Paka Henahi. So, me Kacha Hindi or Puar Angreji, Mixter Bashako, Ram Ram Karke Borti Hun, Iskeri Maki Jie. So, let me introduce by myself a little bit. Uh, Morikawa Sensei already introduced me, but anyway, I will introduce by myself. My name is Yoko, living in Osaka, Japan. I am an Indian classical dance, Bharatanatyam dancer, and Indian martial arts, Karalipayat practitioner, and one of yogini. Uh, I'm practicing yoga daily, and I'm a yoga instructor. I am a disciple of Padma Bhushan Awadi, C.B. Chandrasekhar Sa, and Shrimati Jaya Chandrasekhar for a long time, may now, this year, 29 years completely this year, and 30 years starting. But you, please, please, you don't, you don't need guess about my age, so. <laughs> and normally, I visit Chennai once a year or once a two year, but in these two and a half Yes, I couldn't visit India because of COVID. I really hope to um, visit Chennai again next year, maybe. So I am a director and founder of Stadio Pirachi. I am learning dance, Kalari Payat, and then I am teaching it in Japan. Uh, I'd like to tell about my journey a little bit. I started learning Bharatanatyam from uh, on 1992 
from one of the Japanese teacher. And then I really want to, I really love to this beautiful art form. So I really want to learn uh, my Indian, Indian guru directly. So I visit, visit to, first I visit to Delhi. It was on 1994. I learned from Shri Mati Chitra Chandra Sheka Dasarati, who is the elder daughter of CBC Sir. And then from next year, 1994, I start visit to Baroda. Because that time, CBC Sir was a professor of Baroda University. So I went to Baroda. But uh, I learned dance from uh, Sa, from CBC Sa, uh, personality, privately only. And since um, year of, uh, 20, 2000, he, uh, after he retired uh, Baroda University, he shifted to Chennai. So I start to visit Chennai yearly. And I had an experience in, I had invited my guru, CBC Sa and uh, Jaya Ben. Uh, ben is a, uh, in Gujarati, like a J, like a, like a, I called Anu J, like J is Baroda, is Ben. So I, I called to Jaya, Jaya Mami, is a Jaya Ben. So anyway, I invited Sa and Jaya Ben and three of musicians, one of the is, Mutu Krishna and Muritanga Minist is a Shri Bara Krishna Sa and singer is a Sarayu Srinivasan, Shri Mati Sarayu Srinivasan. These three, are three musicians and two of my guru, totally five, five people I had invited to Japan from Chennai and um, program several press program with dance program, several places of Western part of Japan in Kansai area. And after that, I had invited Shrimati Chitra on 2004 from Delhi to Japan. And uh, she is an elder daughter, CBC sir, as I told before. And I had invited Shrimati Manjari is a second daughter, CBC Sir. It was a 2012. And danced together on the stage and doing workshop here in Japan or Nara uh, in Kansai area and lecture demonstration. I really want to uh, inform dance, Indian culture, what I've learned to Japanese people. Uh, my studio is, I'm a director and founder of studio, studio Prachi. Prachi is a Sanskrit word. That name given from my guru, CBC Sir, put my name. Prachi means uh, in Sanskrit in East or Eastern because of from Japan is a Eastern country from India. So he, want to um, yoko will dance well in Japan and Japanese people knows about Excuse Indian me. culture well. So he- Mats Matsusha-san, can hey. you hear me? Yes. Just uh, there is a request from yes. uh, Dr. Anu and so on. Um, yes. Please, some, something to tell about dance and something. Uh, the dance is, um, you know, just a, uh, some little bit practice and uh, to show something uh, there okay. if it's possible. Okay. Uh, mm. Can I share the screen, Anuji? Mm. Yeah. No, that wouldn't be possible. Uh, we can show it mm. later, maybe if you have time in the symposium. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. now, if you could okay. just tell us about your dance and about the martial arts. Okay. Uh, yeah, here in Japan, uh, two and a half hours, there are no festival, no program because of COVID. But in from this April, start a program little, bit, little by little. Because of concert 
インディア、コンサルジェネラルオブインディア、シュリー、ニキレッシュ・ギリー、イズ・ベリー・アクティブ・パーソン、ヒ・ゲーブス・ミー、ヒ・ゲーブス・ジャパニーズ・アーティスト、チャンス・トゥ・ダンス。そう、ヒス、ゼラ・ワン、huge Indian festival we called Indian Mera at Kobe. It's,、uh, and, it's three years closed. But this year, year again, あのまた始まったんですね。<笑>すいません。英語が出てこなかった。えっ、ー、と、anyway, this, huh? Yeah, yeah, because of pandemic. But this, this year started Indian Mera. And this at Kobe for the three days, えっとね、5万人来ましたね。The audience came to 5万。50,000 people. Yeah, yeah. <笑> And、uh, he gave me a chance to he,、uh, consolidate India, held my program just one week back. One week back Friday, I danced. Uh, Fenice Sakai is a Osaka from the Osaka who Sakai Shi. Sakai Shi is a big, big city in Osaka. That very beautiful, nice hall. I danced my program organized by Consulate India. But I, what I think is there are so many Indian fans. People love India. So many people is here in Japan. But they still they like s only curry, Indian curry, because of Indian food also delicious. But, but on, they know only naan and chicken curry, who、uh, that makes by Nepali cook. Is is they thought it's a In Indian, it's a really Indian curry in the food, and they enjoy it now. So, and they, of course, they saw the dance, they listen and enjoy the music,、uh, Santur, Tabla, Star. But、um, they, but it's very difficult to inform for Japanese deep, deep culture. Yeah.、Um, what can I say? But yoga is familiar in Japan. Here,、yeah, everybody can do yoga. Of course, as a Western people also can do. But, but、um, in dance, few, so many p e r s o n l i k e s yoga. And few people like、uh, Bollywood dance. And who, <laughs> Baratantian is. Only, only, only few people. That is a, もうこれが現実なんですね。That is a, a reality. Real, reality. I danced 30 years here in Japan teaching students.、Mm. But everybody is very busy. Teacher, I, I, my knees is pain. I have to pick up my children. Yes, I understood. But It's a, yes, in fact, it's a very difficult to inform to real Indian culture.、Mm -hmm. And I am a yogini. I'm doing yoga, teaching yoga also. And, and I learned, I read a yoga sutra also. And now I'm learning Shrima Bhagavad Gita at the Gita Pariwar for every night. 40 minutes program. Now,、uh, seven months is over. It's a one year program about Gita Pariwar. I think I run, I'm doing Bharatanatyam and Karalipayat and yoga, but what I think is yoga is basic for everything. And your,、uh, Bharatanatyam is not just an exercise, it's a worship, it's a way to pray to God. It's a way to divine to God. And Karalipayat also, it's a, I feel 
It's a moving yoga. It's a dynamic yoga. It's a martial arts, but it's a, it's a, these things is very improved by my spirituality very well. So basic is yoga. But uh, Gita is a uh, origin for everything. Bhagavad Gita is uh, God's words. Bhagavad Gita is everything origin. I see what I think is uh, top of the mountain is the same, even different religion. Even Christian people, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, no religion, like past, no religion people also. But uh, which way is climbing is a different. But top of the mountain is the same. But it's, uh, I think it's a uh, Gita. Gita is a very strongest way to connect divine to top of the mountain, I feel. So I, I think nowadays, so many information, so many technology is easy and convenient to life and easy to find out. And knowledge only silke bahotohe. Tamanse nahi. Or fast silme. Or iske bat man. Manke under. And I think after that should come to inside bottom of body. Anika was inside the scope. So, yeah, I, mental, I don't know what the pro property is, but Monica says I need to hear what's the, in Japanese, like, funi ochiru toka ne, tanden toka ne, atashi ga ita no wa, atma de, mune de, tsugi, hara nan desu. Onaka jane de, hara. Head, chest, stomach. Mm -hmm. ah, Head, yeah. chest, stomach. I know the, I know the stomach, but uh, mm -hmm. I know the, so, something. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, so, um, deeply coming into the bottom of a, a stomach, something. So this, so this, so this, so this. Ne? Oh. Every technology is. Yeah, it's very, I know, it's it's very nice. It's very good, but because of technology, we lost the primitive power. Human beings originally has. Mm. So. For so they all who say good time, me yoga, Karipai, Baratanatium, wisdom of India is a very nice way. Is that mean nature of the power, power of nature, just uh, take into your whole body? Is that through dancing, uh, power of nature, Shizen no Chikara, something? So, I, I, genshi teki na ningen no motte genshi teki na chikara. Primitive power. Primitive power. Primitive power. Okay. Yeah. I think we, everybody, not only Indian, but also Japanese, but also Western, and all over the world, people should not lost this primitive power, I think. For, yeah, for this, um, please. I, I really want to inform again, mm. come and yeah, yoga, yoga, mm. type it, Bharatanatyam. If difficult to describe it, by what you mean, are the, is this feeling? Is that, um, sorry, I can't understand. Mm. Mm. Um, dance or meet them out, show. So everybody dance to understand you. I what I want to say is wisdom of India is a very, very strongest, very good to physical, mental, and spirituality for everything. Mm. So we have to share for all over the world. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, so much. I'm sorry. I, my English is very poor and sorry no, for no. the end. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Very good.
So I now invite Prabhakar, Dr. Prabhakar, to make his presentation. Uh, please. Uh, Dr. Pra oh, Dr. Prabhakar, is he here? I oh, think he's here. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Prabhakar. Uh, please, uh, um, I like invite you to make his presentation, your presentation. So please go ahead if it's possible. Hello. Oh. Oh yes. Yoko san. Oh, okay. Finished. Okay. Please. Can you hear? Uh, Dr. Uh, Prabhakar, Prabhakar. Sorry, my pronunciation is not good. <laughs> Excuse me. So, <laughs> あの日本語にない発音なので、結局難しいんですよね。はい、そうですね。プラバハ、パですから、プラバカール。はい。Will you try? Roman のロ、バカのバカ。プラバカール。プラバカール。はい、プラバカールですけど。<笑>いいですか。はい。はい、今から始め。お願いします。はい。皆さん、こんにちは。あの、私、私はプラバカールと言いますので。インドのネイル大学の国際関係研究所で。日本研究と日本のいろいろなこと、政治と。経済、現代、日本で変わっていることをついて教えてましたから、今ちょっと手にして、南インド、バンガルールの近くに来ました。はい、今からの私の今日のサブジェクトは、チームは、日本とインドの経済関係、今のことですけど、ちょっと話し,しましょう。あ、ウェリー、グッドモーニングとエリワン。Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this event. I thank Anujindal and IAC、uh, and others responsible.、Uh, since India Japan relations and e c o n o m i c have a. India Japan r e l a t i o n has centuries of.、Uh, Uh, history、uh, that I'm not going to touch. Contemporary period I'd like to talk about. Is it okay? I think somebody else is talking now.、Uh, yeah, I heard.、Uh, I don't know. So it is disturbing, you know? Can I continue? Yes, yes. Okay.、Uh, I, I try to emphasize the contemporary India Japan economic relations or some aspects.、Uh, with war, defeat, surrender, and occupation of Japan by the Allied forces and led by the United States, planning for post war period development was very clearly laid.、Uh, the destruction was so much by war. But most of the production system and industrial structures were destroyed, but Japanese human talent were not destroyed. That really greatly helped with American plan of developing Japan after World War II. Between 1945 and 1952,、uh, occupation period we call, during which time Japan considerably really progressed. That time it was India, which was exporting some textile material to、uh, Japanese, and even、uh, particularly for the growth and、uh, subsequent success of Japanese iron and steel industry, it's India which exported、uh, iron ore for a long time, a large quantity. But however,、uh, with occupation period over by 1952, Japan took off independently. And by 1964, Japanese growth was so much, development was so much 
that there was no sign other than the memorial in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that there was war and destruction. It developed so much that Western and international media that was present in Japan to cover the Olympic Games really also by side uh, developed stories and uh, wrote about through editorial and other description with pictures that how Japan has really progressed. Actually, 1952 and 1972, we call high growth era in Japanese economic development. More than 10% of annual growth was registered for more than 20 years uh, without any break in any year. But unfortunately, that was the time when most of the Japanese uh, industries were uh, consumer-oriented industry. Uh, pharmaceuticals were there, textiles were there, petrochemicals were there, and also iron and steel was there, paper and pulp were there. So they were also creating some pollution. So what happened in the year 1973, there was a major oil crisis globally uh, because of uh, the Arab League and because of oil producers, oil supply was cut and price was raised, thereby making buying of oil in insufficient capacity, but paying very huge price. So Japanese learned a big lesson from the first oil crisis in 1973. They made a restructuring of their entire industry. And what they did was polluting industries like uh, petrochemicals, paper and pulp, textiles, they all sent to other Asian countries, which were just developing, wanted Japanese technology. And Japan at home has transformed actually from such industries to no pollution industry. Uh, example, electronics and automobile. And from 1973 to 1978, uh, this kind of a transformation was happening in Japanese industrial structure. But when 1978, when second oil crisis happened, by then Japanese had already succeeded in transferring their production system from oil-based to non-oil, non-diversification of energy-based resources to other forms of uh, energy. And they succeeded greatly. And actually in the 80s, late 80s, uh, the whole of 80s decade was called bubble economy. Everything was really bubble any day has to burst. So uh, late 80s and early 90s, Japan set into a, a recessionary mode in their economy just because of that bubble burst. But subsequently, Japanese have stabilized. India-Japan relations to talk about in the pre-1980s, it was majorly with two major Japanese companies. One was uh, a wristwatch making company, that is Citizen, which is located very close to Osaka in Sakai city. They had an agreement with India's Hindustan Martin Tools, that HMT. So that was one of the consumer watch and clock making industry. We had an agreement for a long time. That was India-Japan joint collaboration. Second was, Nissan company used to export in huge number Nissan engine, which in India we used to use for a brand called Shaktiman uh, track and uh, trucks in the Indian military requirements. So these were the only two major visible uh, joint structures that we had before uh, 80s. But the advent of Maruti Suzuki company in the year 1984 and 85 and production rolled out huge number of cars. Really, it was a hit. And Rajiv Gandhi, who was our prime minister, he signed science and technology agreement with uh, the Japanese. And then uh, really technology started flowing and not just the major uh, state government uh, industries, but to many private small industries also collaboration started happening. Now we have so many Japanese subsidiaries and Japanese owned companies in India, production centers in India. Most of the consumer goods that Japanese companies and India Japan collaboration companies are marking. And today in Indian consumer market, Japanese have a huge presence. Of course, the competitor are South Korea and uh, China in a big way, not any other uh, countries to talk about. But however, uh, in economic relations, when I'm uh, trying to focus upon as one of the major aspects uh, to talk in today's event, uh, 
uh, in economic relations, when we talk, we usually study that in uh, three headings. One is uh, trade relations. Second is ODA. The, and third is investment. So one, uh, these three are usually the economic uh, uh, area, how we cover India-Japan economic relations. Uh, to talk about trade, uh, say, for example, in the year 2008, it was about India's uh, exports to Japan was in the order of 544 billion yen. But by 2021, it was 744 billion. At the same time, from Japan to India, the export in the year 2008 was 819 billion yen. And by 2021, it was 1,423 billion. All that many years we have been studying the statistics relating to India, Japan trade, Indian deficit with Japan in trade and India's exports to Japan is almost the same. So uh, many bilateral economic delegations talk about trade. We have a target of reaching bilateral trade, say, uh, 2020 itself, it should have touched $25 billion. It had not happened. Now, next target is 2025. We do not know. Anyway, trade is not the only aspect that we have to look at India-Japan bilateral relations. There are many, many other aspects. Coming to talk about Japanese investment in India, in 2008, example, there were 543 billion Japanese yen worth of investment in India. By 2021, it came moderately low to 410 billion Japanese yen. That is because of uh, corona prevailing uh, world over, including in Japan. There were not uh, very great uh, prospects for uh, overseas investment. And Japanese uh, also, like any other country, a bit hesitated. And uh, there was a moderate uh, slow in Japanese investment. However, in future, it is expected to even rise because most of the major cities uh, in India are receiving Japanese investment in form of uh, ODA uh, to make, for example, infrastructure. Infrastructure in something like you know, $5 trillion worth in India if uh, one concentrates. So what's happening is many major cities in India is trying to have metro rail. Uh, so uh, Delhi Metro is one of the most successful uh, project, which now many other states like Karnataka, Chennai, uh, then even uh, Kerala, uh, are all having uh, metro projects uh, underway. And uh, ODA, if we talk about, ODA also come in the form of loan, come in the form of grants, come also in technical cooperation. For example, loans we have uh, received uh, in about uh, year 2021, that is still last year, fiscal year, loan was about 312 billion Japanese yen. Grant is always a small part, which we don't have to pay. Loan we have to pay back to Japan with interest, whereas grants are not to be paid. That is actually 5.2 billion yen we had received in form of grants and technical cooperation uh, amounted to about 7.3 billion Japanese yen. Given these, given this, it speaks how vibrant our economic relations are. Uh, for example, there are uh, so many Japanese even officials, private company officials, Japanese government officials, Jetro officials, JICA officials are all present, very actively studying future prospects for further investment, further economic relations between India and Japan. You know, uh, uh, a number of Japanese uh, people, residents in India are about close to 10,000 in number. Uh, whereas Indians in Japan, if you take, this is the Japanese government statistics I'm uh, referring to, there are 36,000 Indians in Japan. Say out of 36,000 uh, Japanese, actually when I, first visited uh, Tokyo uh, in the year 1982, uh, there were only about 400 Indians in Japan, not many. And recently, uh, to talk of 36,000 Indians present in Japan is a big rise in the number. Uh, major reason is uh, IT companies. In different cities, uh, especially in Tokyo, Yokohama, 
uh, uh, Osaka. Uh, about 6,000 Indians uh, uh, present in Japan are busy in IT industries. So IT industries is one of the major uh, presence in Japan in the present days. Uh, to talk about an example, uh, Tata Consultancy Service, which is located in Tokyo, uh, near uh, Tokyo Tower. One can see the board also there, uh, Kamiacho uh, subway station. Uh, the, they are drawing 70% of their uh, business orders from uh, Mitsubishi company, uh, Japanese large uh, trading companies. And uh, similarly, there are many other, including uh, Nomura, for example, they are also employing Indian people and Fujitsu, Indian people. In so many Japanese large corporations, uh, Indians are present. Uh, I can pick this uh, Indian IT workers moving to Japan and trained uh, bilingual and uh, monolingual Indians, uh, mechanical engineers, etc., trying to go to Japan. Uh, number is rising. There are so many private institutions in India trying to teach Japanese language and business language to the Indian people, Indian engineers, especially IT people also. And in many Indian institutes, Japanese language is being taught, which is one of the most uh, popular and uh, sought after uh, programs to study. With Japanese language being in the talent, besides uh, IT and engineering talent, the flow from India of Indian uh, engineers to Japan is uh, in the days to come will increase certainly. This is one of the future. All this is happening, more number of workers going to Japan because in Japan we know, uh, socially speaking, Japanese population is declining. That is because uh, birth rate is very, very low in Japan. And even one lady in her average life cannot deliver more than uh, two baby. Actually, it is 1.32 or 38 uh, baby that uh, an average Japanese lady delivers. So given this, old age population is increasing in Japan. They are about 26 to 27%. Meaning working population in Japan has stabilized on the lower side. So in the future, there will be very few Japanese workers, whether Japanese company or industry or offices, anywhere. So they need to depend on other Asians who can speak Japanese also. And uh, not that only India will have an easy way uh, to Japanese facilitated nowadays by easy visa, multiple entry visa, etc. But uh, what uh, Indian concern, I think, is uh, Filipinos, for example, 80% uh, of the population in Philippines speak English. So even Americans are trying to hire more and more Filipino workers to place them in Asia because they speak good English. And at the same time, for future Indians traveling to Japan to work in the industries like IT, et cetera, Philippine is going to give a uh, run for the money, meaning good competition. So future trend to watch is IT industry in Japan and their dependency extent on the Indian trained IT workers uh, with Japanese language skill and how they will face uh, some kind of a rivalry uh, given uh, Filipino uh, increasingly becoming a preference for Americans and the Japanese also. I think uh, most of my sources are from uh, Japanese media and India-Japan media and also what we read widely relating to Japan and watch uh, through Japanese media, example like uh, NHK TV or Japanese uh, Nikkei Shimbun or even Yomuri and Asahi, Japan Times, and even uh, talking to Japanese uh, academicians who, with whom I have good relations when they visit us or when we meet, we keep talking about these things. I thank uh, for giving me this uh, time of 15 to 20 minutes to make my presentation to Anu Jindal and IAC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, can I hear? Can you hear or view? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Prabha. Oh, thank you. I thank so all the speak three speakers for making such interesting, informative presentations.
uh, we haven't had interesting variation in these presentations. We have um, Mr. Hasegawa took us on a visual journey. Um, so I like to visit Niigata to visit uh, his museum one day. I'm looking forward. And while uh, Ms. Matsushita has shown her love for India through her dance and uh, very um, colorful, interesting, uh, so mixed of uh, India traditional dances. I'm also looking forward uh, since I have been in, in Kansai, so not far from where we are uh, from each other. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Prabhakar has highlighted how the economic relations between Japan and India are faring and what a new aspect can be added to move further in this direction. I know many Indians who have already uh, Japanese language proficiency. So one day some Japanese will learn Japanese from Indian people here. Thank you so much. That's all from me. Thank you so much, Morikawa-san. That was uh, excellently handled and wonderful presentations. Thank you to all. Bye-bye. So Sayonara. Bye -bye. Sayonara. Bye-bye. <laughs>
So maybe start. Yes. Uh, so welcome to session two of the Japan India Synergy Vision 2052 Symposium. Uh, I noticed there are some new faces who've just joined. So just uh, briefly, again, the introduction. And this is all about uh, envisioning the future of Japan-India relations. We hope they will deepen, they'll further. We'll have more and more strategic partnerships. And uh, this is the 70th year of the establishment of Japan-India uh, diplomatic relations we are celebrating. And the vision 2052 is that it will be even further deepened by then. We have a variety of topics that we are dealing with in this symposium, from politics to global partnerships, Japanese uh, grants assistance. We all know about the Delhi Metro, and uh, of course, environment and uh, climate change. Uh, we are very lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Vibhadhavan, who's the Director General of Terry. So she, I hopefully she'll be telling us on that aspect. And in this session, then we have uh, Dr. Hajime uh, Hasegawa. He's from Meiji Gakuen University. I'm so sorry, there's a mistake in the circular that has been passed. It's written as Gakuen University. He's Meiji Gakuen University, Tokyo. So he'll be talking on an area of manga. That's a Japanese animation. And uh, then we have Dr. Nisha Taneja from ICREA. And then we have uh, Dr. Satoru Nagao. He's fellow non-resident from Hudson Institute, Washington, but he's joining us from Tokyo. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to leave a little early. My colleague, Mr. Gautam Mukherjee, will take over the chair. And if we have time, we've got a panel of four. So if we have some time, we'll also entertain a few questions. Uh, thank you so much. And over to you, Dr. Dhawan. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I haven't made a structured presentation. And that's largely because I thought I'll basically uh, plan it according to the audience. Now, it goes without saying, if we look at uh, India's and Japanese partnership. It goes over 70 years. And it is something that when we are looking at this partnership, it's one of the most fruitful ones. And yesterday night, uh, I was at the ambassador's residence. And one thing that the ambassador told, and he said that the prime minister, uh, basically because you entertain your political friends in a particular forum, but perhaps Prime Minister Modi is the only one to whom he has invited at his residence. So that speaks volumes of the relationship. And the new ambassador, Mr. Suzuki, he's new to the country, uh, to India. He has assumed his new responsibility on 9th of this month. And it was amazing yesterday when he started uh, his lecture, he started in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And for someone to learn and to speak, give a lecture, less than 20 days of his arrival in India shows the kind of sincerity. And I thought, let me try to speak a couple of words in Japanese, but I failed because in the morning when I went to the office, I got engrossed in other things. But you know, the detailing part. Now, it goes without saying when we are talking of partnership, the partnership succeeds when both the partners are benefited in some way or the other. And that is what it is. If we look at, and many of you must have visited Japan, culturally, we are so similar. It's like in a way, it is that the diversity in Indian states perhaps is as much as diversity between India and Japan. We look at the basic character of people. Of course, I'll, I'll rate them higher than us. And there is something we need to learn. And I was so like this after COVID, Japan is the only country which I have already visited twice. And it was something like how humble they are. You talk to the head of the organization, you reach there, you introduce yourself and they'll bend like this. And I, I, that is so similar because the kind of respect or what have been engraved in our minds always is that you need to be humble wherever you are. But somewhere we have perhaps forgotten. We are not that serious, but Japanese still are. There's so many things to be imbibed from them. 
they walk a lot like we talk of public transportation in the country but over there right from the airport it is so convenient to take the public transport and go wherever you are typically all their metro stations the maximum walking is 15 minutes wherever you have to go and the roads people they are so nice although english or language is still remains a bit of a problem but you know they will just switch on uh, switch on their google they'll try to translate everything they will tell you where you have to go they will walk with you in case you are looking for your hotel that where exactly you have to go and i do remember in my first ever trip overseas was after my phd and i was received by uh, professor tanaka who had also reviewed my thesis so he came to the airport with his wife and of course he dropped me in the hotel and thereafter it was all planning to the labs and i traveled up to sendai uh, in the bullet train so i'm talking of 1986 so that time bullet train was like a dream that you are sitting in a bullet train and uh, of course that was introducing me to various colleagues over there and the kind of work they were doing and so on and of course i'm in 1986 things were not that commonly available in the country so i just told him that i want to buy something in which i can keep the slides and of course i never knew we got down at some station he took me one shop second shop we must have spent half an hour to locate a shop where i could buy that and i felt this is the level of sincerity that since i have told him I, i'll say even if it was me perhaps i would have said we'll try to see if we can buy it but he ensured that i'm able to buy it and i was practically no one because it was my supervisor who knew him. I went there and he also told me that he su recently superannuated and he was 80 plus. So for someone at his age to come and receive me with his wife, drive me to the hotel, take me to Sendai and ensured whatever I needed, I could buy it. And same, just recently I went and someone told me to buy a uh, citron tea and which was not that common in japan but the organizers of the conference they ensured that i get it so they ordered it online so that it was delivered to me in the hotel so that is sincerity and as i said that when we talk of sustainability and today the entire world is struggling hard due to the climate change and lots of things again, which I learned from them. Why the climate change is occurring, we all know it is largely industrialization. And somewhere it is also that we are not really conscious of what we are doing. It has become a con consumeristic society in India and world over. We also, we are following waste. It is use and throw kind of policy. We are talking of electronic waste in, a, in very large numbers. We talk of like if, and I'm sure you all notice it on, date, on daily basis, how the society has changed. I remember when we were students, but first of all, my parents will not even go to leave me to the bus station uh, and in the college. Uh, so we will walk to the bus station there will be few DTC buses and you have to run after them to get into the bus and be successful. There were no rickshaws at that time. So in university also, you have to walk at least few, uh, half a kilometer or so to reach your college. And thereafter, in a way you will carry from home. It will be in the cloth, not aluminum foil that you throw that very day. So everything was that we believed in sustainability. Then was the next era of our children. And then it started that, okay, most of the time parents will run to the, or take their children to the bus station. Sometimes they'll walk for the school bus and sometimes you'll drive them to, on the car to the bus station. 
and today 50% of the students in public schools their drivers go and drop them in the morning and then they go and bring them back in the afternoon and then we talk about that the climate change or delhi is no more a livable city but who is contributing to it i think it's every stakeholder which is contributing to it each one of us and again we are the ones who are suffering also because of it we take it we all discuss what happened at the cop tell me what can we expect at the cop it is that at cop it is basically negotiations you are talking about who is doing wrong we this year we talked about loss and damage a uh, loss and damage fund but is it really going to help us i and uh, i told someone i said look loss and damage the person who has lost his life if this fund comes is it going to change his family is it going to bring life back and that fund is not really going to simply give money to his family that this he must be earning this much and therefore we are paying you this much it's not going to be that way and we always believe prevention is better than cure so therefore we have to somehow ensure that climate change does not happen the way it has happened in the past or the uh, way we have used our natural resources in the past well of course our prime minister honorable prime minister has also given the slogan life and one is trying to work towards that that you are conscious of the environment of your actions and it should become a movement but without this slogan also few things which i learned on my recent trips to japan and i found that they if we look at the economically perhaps they are better than us in terms of per capita income but they don't waste at all you look at they are, yes they want to use apple phone but it is not like what we are doing in india we want to change every second year our phone whether we need it or not you look at the televisions and they say that and i was told that they have to pay if you want to discard your television you have to pay for it it is not that i give it to someone else or uh, there is an unorganized sector of kabadi and they'll pick it up the answer is no so over there you have to take it back to the store you have to give it and say this is the cost to recycle this particular equipment so they are very very conscious in terms of where should i spend my money and the moment you are paying a cost to discard a particular piece of equipment you also think twice that it is not just money first of all i have to shell out some money to take care of it and secondly is a thinking process that it actually costs this much and perhaps more to take care of the environment they all walk all the time you'll find so but so disciplined like even if it's a road where no one is there till the time it becomes green they keep on standing and once it is green perhaps it's something like you say that it's like old delhi that there are so many people crossing that particular juncture so discipline is something which we need to learn no pickpocketing like in spite of there are so many people on the road in the metro there is rush but you know that nothing is going to happen to your belongings so it is such a safe country and so therefore there is a <coughs> lot of learning from japan to india i'll also like to touch upon that when we are talking of climate change and we all have seen what has happened in the last one year the means uh, you talk about or, or our country delayed rains the way it has impacted because wheat harvesting got uh, sorry rice harvesting got delayed and then it had impact on uh, sowing wheat uh, and because see you need dried grain so therefore and uh, but and if we look at japan 
they have also because of the rising temperature and change in the monsoon pattern they are also facing similar problems now for both the countries it becomes extremely important that we really look into or we need to find ways that how do you reduce the changing climate or changing temperature the other thing similarity between two of us is also that we depend on the on the fossil fuel which we have is coal and therefore we are quite dependent on coal for many more years to come but then it is also that while japan is and also unfortunately uh, there uh, the tectonic plates that makes them quite prone to earthquakes in that region and that ha many have occurred in the past and they also have to be extra sensitive and because india uh, our subcontinent is also becoming closer to the tectonic plates and so in years to come we will also be quite prone to more of the earthquakes and therefore it's important that even our building designs and others are more towards tolerating that we need to have early warning signals and so on so the problems are more or less similar and we need to work together in r&d there have been lots and lots of initiatives and uh, when we talk of our partnership a very healthy partnership that has also occurred in the field of r&d r&d as well as pilot projects to show that the technology works and the two organizations uh, jica and nido they are working in india and there are large number of projects both on research and implementation side and of course as institute teri has also been benefited quite a bit we have done very large number of projects with japanese uh, government and very successful ones and i'll say in some of the projects of course we got the initial grant from them nido for example for waste treatment and then of course after the proof of concept government of india also supported and that project became a reality for implementation i'll also like uh, my last trip to japan was largely to look into the large hydrogen production plant which they have set up near sendai and you know it it it's uh, because uh, we uh, in the terry as an institute is also very keen and i thought let me see what is going to be the feasibility of such a plant it is spread over 35 hectares of land it seeing is believing that the entire or most of the energy that you need to produce hydrogen is through solar and the way everything is done over there is that you hardly need manpower it is everything is automatic everything is precise and right from the train like you book the ticket and you know which seat you have to sit and exact time so everything works as if there is no traffic on the road there isn't anything because everything is worked out it's minute to minute kind of a program the plant itself it's state of art everything great and i personally feel that those collaborations because uh, again if we look at japan yes there are few industries which fall in the category of small and medium but by and large there are large companies but then the technology which is developed over there has lot of potential clients in india and it needs to be transferred to small and medium enterprises and that is where there is lot of scope to collaborate because i always say large companies of course they are making commitments in our country they want to be net zero as soon as possible but if as a country we need to succeed we have to bring smes in this entire journey of going clean and the collaboration with japan will take us a long way the japanese companies in the country where uh, whether it is toyota and many uh, or others they are moving in this very direction they want their campus to be net zero they have come up with 
a hybrid car, which was recently inaugurated uh, by Gadkari ji. So over there, it is that we can do it. This is, of course, right now very expensive. But for any technology, that is the path to be followed. First is proof of concept. It can happen. And then you work on the economics. And that is what is being done right now. Now, as uh, Anu also mentioned that Japanese collaborations, if we look at the dream of Indian, every Indian family owning a car, that came true through Maruti. And it is one of the collaborations uh, which is so successful. And that has shown way to our country, our co country manufacturers, because prior to that, we were just stuck with Ambassador and Fiat and practically no change in design and so on. But now it has become a competitive world and cars had become far more energy efficient and affordable. So similarly, Metro, and it's really speaking, perhaps before Metro came, we could have never imagined that you can have underground Metro in old Delhi. And the entire process, it was done so quietly that the work never suffered, but we have best of the infrastructure. So therefore, as a country also, we are grateful to Jap Japanese government for providing all the support. And I personally feel that there are going to be many more such opportunities to collaborate and make this planet more livable. So with this, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take if there are any questions. Thank you. Dr. Dhawan has to leave, so we'll take the questions first, if you have, we'll, if somebody has questions. Yeah, please, you could put on your mic. Yeah, good afternoon. That was a very interesting talk. Unfortunately, we have not emulated the Japanese model at all because our metros uh, are not well planned at all. There is so much of walking. There is no last minute connectivity and every station is crowded with those auto rickshaws. So it's a traffic hazard. And like interchange stations also, like INA and uh, medical and all this, I have been there. I mean, it is not uh, friendly with the senior citizens at all. You have to walk so much, uh, you know, underground. So I think uh, we still have a lot to learn from the Japanese. I totally agree, from, I agree with you. And one major difference I'll say between our community and Japanese community is, I'll also touch upon the eating habits. In India, we love to eat. We make so many dishes, we love to eat. And one of my cousins who is a doctor, he's a heart surgeon and he says to all my patients, I tell them that whatever you eat, give 30% of that to a poor. So that is going to improve your health and that holds very true. The way in Japan, if you look at their eating habits, they hardly eat anything. The oil consumption in their diet perhaps will be one tenth of average Indian family. They eat lots of vegetables. They take green tea with the result. And I, I'll go back to 1986 uh, when uh, Dr. Tanaka came to receive me. He told me he's 80 year old and in a way, it was a shock to me. I felt he won't be more than 50. So what happens is you rightly said that it is becoming a hazard. And especially with the battery buses, the uh, battery cars, they don't even know how to drive. The, but the problem is, and I also touched upon that, that what has happened, we still used to walk. But this generation, if you look at your own children, if they, they will not be willing to walk for 10, 15 minutes, they will take their car to the gym. They will never walk. So it is not that the metro stations are ill-planned. Yes, to some extent, yes. But more than that, the problem is, as an Indian, we are not willing to walk for 10 to 15 minutes. While in Japan, I the first time, and they tell you that, please take at all the hotels, they are closer to the uh, metro station. And with luggage, everyone walks 10 to 15 minutes. 
rather in this very trip and i told them i was little lazy and being an indian and <laughs> extra weight so i told them can your bus take a u turn and drop us and the answer was no it's just 10 minute walk you can walk so you can't say anything to them but to walk but over here it will be something like i can't walk come on 10 minutes so either give me a taxi or give me or drop me over there and they knew it i was not the only one so many of the participants perhaps 10 of us were staying in that hotel but then they were made a u turn and as i said discipline also because here if it's one way you don't bother so if you have to take a turn of 3 kilometers perhaps you will become more sensitive towards walking but yes there were problems and i'll say it is not their problem they provided us with the metros but how to plan the station and of course it's uh, that was our wish and we are also learning maybe other met the metro stations will be little better can i say one more thing about walking Actually, now no we we over on our time a lot sorry uh, so no no thank you uh, we we over yeah so thank you so much dr thawan wonderful inputs on uh, inputs on japan and uh, uh, i didn't read out dr thawan's uh, resume it's 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 like huge and you can all check it on uh, the website of terry and uh, otherwise we passed around printed uh, sing also so we go on to our next speaker dr hajime hasegawa He is a professor of media studies at Meiji Gakuen University, Tokyo, and uh, he has spent fifteen years of his career working as an editor. He was also at Center for Japanese Studies as a visiting scholar, University of Michigan, the USA, from seventeen to twenty eighteen. He has many publications and monographs, and uh, his talk is "India as a Fountain in the Japanese Popular Culture Context," focusing on the nineteen seventies. children's action tv drama rainbow man so over to you professor hasegawa ah uh, thank you very much uh, hello everyone uh, can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah, yeah thank you thank you uh, i'm honored to be invited to give a presentation at such a significant conference today my major is Uh, media studies and the uh, cultural sociologies. So the presentation will be as well. Uh, I hope you can relax and enjoy it. So I want to uh, share the my slides. Um, keynote. Oh, uh, can I? Sorry. Oh. Okay. Oh, can I share the video? Okay. This one. Ah. Uh, yes, we can see it now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, the topic of my presentation is Rainbow Man, the Warrior of Love, a Japanese special effects transformable hero TV drama for children in the early uh, 1970s. Do you know Rainbow Man? No, probably. Oh, uh, but no. we'll know now after you tell <laughs> okay. us. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, here he is. Uh, don't you think he is cool? Uh, I'm not sure what today's Indian people think of him, but in the early 1970s, many of Japanese children, including me, actually, were crazy about Rainbow Man. Uh, we will look at him in more detail later. In Japanese culture, India has been given a variety of images. One of the most central images is a fountain or spring. 
It is a special fountain. While far away from Japan, it is a mystic fountain which can provide us supernatural powers and wisdom. The image must uh, be rooted in the historical fact and memory that Buddhism, which originated in India, was introduced to Japan from Central Asia by China and Korea about 1,500 years ago. Culture can be divided into various levels. In this presentation, we will focus on popular culture rather than high culture. This is because popular culture is often full of misunderstandings, ignorance, and stereotypes, but it sometimes reveals the essence of the culture. Uh, let us look at one example of stereotypes in popular culture context in Japan. That is curry. In Japan, curry is one of the typical images of India and curry and rice is one of the most popular dishes in Japan also. Actually, there are numerous curry products available in supermarkets in Japan. <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> I cannot say the exact number of that, but anyway, many kinds of curry roux are sold. And many of them claim that this is Indian curry like this, because Japanese people believe that India is the home and origin of curry, while actually Japanese culture, sorry, Japanese curry is quite different from Indians. Look at the characters on those Indian curry boxes. They are supposed to be Indian. For Japanese people, they are the typical image of Indian males. Interestingly, all the Indian guys on the boxes wear turbans on their heads. But as you know, the head turban is a custom found among Sikhs. It is not a feature common to Indian males in general. This is one of the stereotypes of the Japanese image about the Indian males. Uh, this is a TV commercial film from 1964. So very short film. During only five seconds, it advertises the curry rule. So like this. Uh, you can hear the sound? Okay. Uh, and a man wearing a turban on his head appears and exclaims, even the Indians are surprised. Incidentally, this person is not a real Indian, but a Japanese actor, Gannosuke Ashiya. It looks somewhat strange. In 1957, the writer and critic Yoshie Hotta wrote in his famous book, What I Thought in India. Indo de koto, that he was surprised to realize that he knew nothing about India. However, he was able to be aware of his ignorance about India because he was an intellectual. I think most of the public would have said, India, I don't know much about it, but I know it. It is a curry country, right? If anyone is offended by these topics, please forgive me. In the popular culture context, images are often full of stereotypes based on ignorance and misunderstandings. However, even within such popular culture, sometimes we can find something essential that is usually hidden underlying the culture. Rainbow Man is just such an example. This TV program was broadcasted nationwide from 1972 to 1973. At that time, there was a huge boom in transformable hero stories in Japan, and many similar programs were produced. All of them were produced with limited budgets, time, personnel, equipment, and technology, so the quality looked very cheap. Nevertheless, the transformable heroes excited the enthusiasm among the children. 
the basic format of the transformable hero stories is simple and nonsensical. A young Japanese man transforms into a hero to gain superhuman powers and fight enemies. Of course, Ryan Bowman shared this basic format with other similar films. However, Rain Bowman was unique among the numerous transforming hero stories of the time. Above all, it was in its setting. An Indian saint was the most important key character who taught his supernatural abilities to the main character of a Japanese guy. No other heroes had featured India on such a large scale at that time. The main character is a young Japanese guy named Takeshi Yamato. His name is derived from the name of the famous character in Japanese mythology. On the other hand, the Indian saint is called Devadatta. His name is derived from a prominent high this, uh, uh, disciple of the Buddha. In other words, in, the set, in this setting, India with the mystical powers in this seen as a teacher and guide, in short, master for Japan. The story began with Takeshi coming to India to become a dis uh, disciple of Devadatta. However, India was in the middle of the Indo-Pakistan war. Devadatta took pity on the people at war and used his secret art to revive the dead soldiers and sent them back to their homeland. Uh, witnessing this, Takeshi was moved by Devadatta's sincere wish for peace. Completed Devadatta's rigorous training, Takeshi was finally given the secret art and became Rainbow Man. Boeing to use his power for love and peace, Takeshi returned to Japan. That is the beginning of the Rainbow Man story that depicted in the first two episodes. Please let me show you the scene of the birth of Rainbow Man. It is about three minutes long.
Uh, thank you for watching. In the video, uh, Devadatta looks he has dead, but apparently not, because he appears frequently in the following episodes. Uh, that's strange. The setting of the Indian saint was the brainchild of Kohan Kawauchi, the author of the original story, and might be related to his knowledge of Buddhism as the son of a temple owner. However, even for the children at that time who did not know such backgrounds, the Indian setting had indescribable persuasiveness. If there was a saint who had supernatural powers, it could not be anywhere but in India, not in America, not in France or China, but in India. Otherwise, the children would not have been so enthusiastic. Such a way of the Saint Devadatta portrayed in Rainbow Man may suggest one of the typical images of India in Japanese culture. In a word, it is a fountain, as I mentioned. It is a fountain of mystic powers, a fountain of wisdom, and a fountain of life. In fact, this view of India as a fountain of life that could touch the roots of existence can also be found in the pure art context of contemporary Japan. Here, Fuku Akino is an example. Akino was a female Japanese painter in the 20th century. In 1962, she stayed in India as a visiting professor for a year. Since then, she visited India many times and painted many Japanese painting works with the motifs of Indian nature and climate. Japanese painting is a form of painting that uses traditional Japanese materials, techniques, and styles. Many of the Akino's works share one view, such as India is connected to the roots of Japan, not outside of Japan. Thus, one root image of India can appear in different ways at various levels of Japanese culture. That is a fountain far away, but with supernatural powers, full of wisdom and breathing life into all of us. The image of India as a fountain is rooted in the memory of the long, long cultural exchange history that began with the introducing Buddhism in the fifth century. In other words, Behind its amusing and ridiculous appearance of Rainbow Man, he carries the depth of 1,500 years history of cultural exchange. I hope that India and Japan will continue to nurture even deeper mutual exchange of, of cultural understandings. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Hasegawa for your very charming presentation. We thoroughly enjoyed it over here. Yeah, thank you very much. We now have Dr. Nisha Taneja from ICRIER, New Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Taneja. We can't hear you. You're mute. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I really enjoyed listening to the other speakers. And uh, uh, listening to the Cultural Connect, I think if I'm going to be talking about numbers and economics, it's going to be really very dry. So uh, I really don't know how to make my presentation exciting. But uh, before I uh, go to my formal presentation, I'd like to say that how the Japanese culture has touched so many people's lives in India. Um, many of you might be aware that Nichiren Daishonin's uh, Buddhism is actually practiced by a number of people in India, about 250,000 members. Uh, recite the Gongyo in India morning and evening. And I happen to be one of the members and therefore I can say 
uh, how strong this uh, connect is with Japan amongst uh, the members who are followers of uh, the strand of Buddhism. Uh, I have a presentation, so let me just try and connect. One moment. One moment. Just give me a moment, please. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, this is work, ongoing work that we've been doing on India-Japan um, trade and uh, foreign direct investment. Um, uh, and uh, I won't go back too much in history, but maybe I'll begin with the, the uh, India-Japan um, uh, SIPA, which is the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which was signed in 2011, that was really the turning point in uh, the relationship, the economic relationship that India and Japan have with each other. And uh, this was really one of the first forward-looking FTAs because it was it was uh, wide in its coverage and deep in its scope. Uh, you know, the, we covered a number of, not, not only did, did we have goods, investment and services, but we also had the newer and more ticklish issues like intellectual property, competition and government procurement. And uh, so in that sense, it was really a very forward-looking um, uh, forward uh, agreement. But 10 years down the line, uh, there have been concerns and now we are talking about revisiting the agreement and uh, trying to see how the agreement can be updated. And this request has re really come from the Indian side because uh, we do feel that in the last 10 years, uh, the trade deficit has actually gone up and there has been a concern in India that maybe we have not focused enough on India's market access into, uh, into Japan. And maybe at this time, uh, it is worthwhile looking at this issue because Japan is also trying to look at how it can diversify its uh, import uh, from other countries. Uh, you know, They're also looking at the China plus one strategy quite seriously. So in that sense, there is a meeting of minds and maybe this is really the right time to look at how India could improve its market access into the Japanese market, uh, not just in terms of uh, uh, exports, but also in terms of exploring the investment linkages uh, through trade. And now if you look at uh, uh, the numbers of India-Japan trade, what we can see is that uh, it has fluctuated. There's no, no trend that we can see, no upward trend. It's been up and down. And the maximum trade that the two countries did have was, was about 19, uh, 19 billion in 2012. And in 2020, it was uh, US dollar 14 billion. Uh, if we look at India's trade balance, again, we find that it has fluctuated over time. It's been quite high though. Uh, uh, and it peaked in 2018 when it was uh, $7.8 billion. Um, India's uh, uh, exports to Japan have averaged about uh, $5 billion uh, during the 10-year uh, period, and imports have averaged about uh, $11 billion. Uh, if you look at how India and Japan bilateral trade has fared and how important it is in each country's uh, world trade, what we find is that 
the bilateral trade is actually more uh, more important in uh, in India's trade basket than it is in Japan's trade basket. Now, uh, the rest of the presentation is going to be on what is India's export potential to Japan in the sense that what is the untapped export potential? Uh, how can India increase its market access into Japan? Uh, what are the tariff and non-tariff barriers which India faces in the Japanese market? Then we can we will be discussing how Japan uh, Japanese uh, FDI inflows can actually strengthen the trade and investment linkage. And then we'll discuss how new supply chains can be forged for greater uh, supply chain resilience. Now, if you look at the top export products to Japan, we find that in 2020, the largest uh, share was of organic chemicals. And organic chemicals uh, is really the, the basic raw material for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the second largest uh, item was fish. Uh, the third was mineral fuels. And then we, had pre we have precious and semi-precious stones. And then we have machinery. Now, if we compare it to 2015, we can see that there has been a shift, relative shift in the importance of different commodities. Uh, firstly, we find that in 2015, it was mineral fuels, which was really the largest, uh, largest single largest item. And it had a, a significantly high share at 20, almost 22% uh, in 2015. And this seems to have become more, it, we seem to have a more diversified uh, basket in, uh, in 2020. If you look at imports, we find again that uh, in 2020, we've got machinery as the largest item followed by electrical machinery. And then we have copper, plastics, and inorganic chemicals, uh, which account for eight, accounted for 8%. Again, I think the top two items, uh, roughly the importance has remained the same since, uh, uh, since 2015, but there has been a relative change in the other three items. If we look at a more disaggregated uh, level, we find that uh, the largest share is really of light oil and preparations, which is basically we're talking about uh, refined petroleum. And then the second largest item is frozen shrimp. So even within the fish category, it's really frozen shrimps and prawns, which, is, uh, which accounts for a large share. And then we have diamonds, and then we have iron ore, and then herbicides and uh, the other items at a more disaggregated level. If you look at uh, imports at a more disaggregated level, then we find that copper is the largest item, followed by inorganic chemicals, and then we have poly, uh, polyvinyl chloride, then we have vessels and other floating uh, structures, we have p xylene, which is uh, uh, which is really a raw material for pharmaceuticals, and then we have some uh, automobile parts and other items. Now there is a large untapped export potential and what we've tried to do is we try to do a very simple exercise where we've tried to see what is it that India is, ex uh, what is it that India can, ex uh, what is it that India is, uh, has a relatively, uh, has a comparative advantage in and the, uh, whether whether uh, Japan is actually importing these uh, items from the rest of the world. So in a sense, what we're saying is if Japan can shift from items that it's importing from the rest of the world to India, and particularly those items in which India has a comparative advantage when it's trading with the rest of the world is what we call items where India has an export potential to Japan. And when we did this exercise, what we found was that uh, the export potential is phenomenal. It's about 88 billion. So that gives us an idea about how much the untapped potential is. And there is a huge, uh, uh, th there are 1,511 items in which there is a uh, potential. And th those that are currently traded are 712 and uh, those that uh, new products that can be brought into the fold are about 799 products which can be brought into the fold. Uh, 
we've also tried to look at the tariffs that uh, Indian products face when they are uh, when they are uh, trading when they're being exported to Japan. And what we find is that uh, most of the products actually attract zero tariffs. So ninety one percent of the items face zero tariffs. But products like dairy, uh, cheese. Uh, and other agricultural products like honey and some processed foods actually fall in the highest tariff range, which is between 20 to 35%. But these items actually account only for 0.12% of the total export potential to Japan. So uh, even if these are items that may be of interest, the potential is not much. And so maybe we shouldn't be focusing on items where there isn't that much potential, even though the tariffs are very high. Uh, at a more disaggregated level, what we find is that the largest untapped potential is actually in pharmaceuticals products, and that's about $14 billion. So even though there is a, a trade currently, it's about $63 million, we can see how much more potential there is in this item. Also, what we did see was that in refined petroleum, there was uh, th this was one of the largest items that was being traded. Uh, which was being exported to um, uh, Japan, but yet there is an untapped, a, a huge untapped potential. So even though the current trade is high, there is yet a lot more that can be uh, can be tapped. And then we have iron ore, aluminium, uh, non-light petroleum oils. We still have a lot of untapped potential in jewelry. Um, what is interesting is that basically uh, an item, it, it, meat is an item which is virtually nil, but Japan is importing from the rest of the world. And India is a fairly large exporter of uh, uh, bovine meat to the rest of the world. So this is an item where we could be exporting more uh, to, uh, to Japan. And if we look at ja the tariff levels actually across these products where we think there is a, a very high export potential, we can see that actually tariffs range only between 0.2 and 0.4%. The rest of the items are basically zero tariffs. And so this clearly tells us that uh, even with low tariffs, we are not being able to export. And therefore, what is it that we should be doing so that we can tap the uh, jazz market? Here, for instance, let, uh, we can look at something like T-shirts, that's ready-made garments. Uh, 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 the tariffs are zero, but our exports are almost minimal. And therefore, it could either be, uh, the, uh, either be the regulatory regimes uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are in place for imports, or it is probably lack of understanding of the market. For instance, for t-shirts, one can, one can certainly say that maybe, maybe we are not aware of the Japanese taste and therefore we need to understand it better uh, so that we can um, enter this market. The other thing is like for something like pharmaceuticals, uh, the processes are long and um, uh, the la labeling requirements are quite stringent. But the thing is that obviously there is a lack of understanding uh, between the regulatory regimes, there needs to be a greater exchange of information so that we are able to uh, uh, understand the, the, the regulatory regimes and the non-tariff barriers that in the Indian products could be facing when they're trying to enter this market. And the SEPA should actually be used to, uh, rather than spending so much time on negotiations, I think we should be uh, spending more time on the regulatory regimes and understanding the regulatory regimes. Another interesting thing that we found was that when we looked at these potential items, we tried to see whether, uh, what is the extent of pollution in these industries, the pollution emission in these industries. And uh, to our surprise, actually, most of these were in the red category, which meant that, that these are highly polluting industries. And uh, we just heard Vibha and we heard other speakers as well talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the tolerance levels on environment and on pollution levels in, uh, in Japan. And maybe that's, that's an area that we should be addressing. And that might actually help us in addressing some of our market access issues. 
But here again, there is a question, which is that for textile products or ready-made garment products, this falls under uh, the non-polluting industry. This is the only potential item which falls under the green category, but we're not being able to tap it. So clearly we need to uh, address uh, the other issues that may be hindering uh, our market access into Japan. Next, we try to look at the FDI flows. Uh, and one of the speakers did earlier talk about FDI uh, inflows into India. We do know that uh, Japanese ODI has been very, very substantial, but compared to the ODI, uh, the FDI inflows have been uh, have been far less. In fact, uh, Japanese outward investment is uh, FDI in flows are far more than ODI flows. But in India, it's the other way around. We have more ODA flows than FDI flows. Uh, so um, we can see uh, that uh, actually um, uh, Japan is the fifth largest investor in 2020, and it contributed a cumulative FDI inflow of about 34 um, billion. The largest sectors are automobiles, services, drugs and pharmaceuticals, metallurgical industries and telecommunications. And these five sectors accounted for 62% of the total cumulative FDI from Japan into India in the last 20 years. But here, what I would like to uh, add is that we, that the Indian um, uh, the Indian policies are changing rapidly, and uh, there is again uh, we need to establish linkages that would that would that would uh, uh, that would strengthen information flows on what these new policies mean and how they can be leveraged to uh, to to have stronger economic and uh, trade investment linkages. So that's why uh, I thought it would be important to mention the production linked incentive scheme, which was recently launched by the Indian government. Uh, there are 14 sectors that have been selected under the PLI scheme. And basically this scheme aims to provide incentives of four to 6% to companies on incremental sales uh, over the base year. And there is a huge total uh, outlay for this scheme. And uh, the, one of the reasons is that the, the, this incentive has been uh, given to, to, uh, to help investors to overcome their cost disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. And so even though it looks like it is an incentive that is, uh, that is for uh, Indian investors, it's actually for any investor, whether it is an Indian investor or a foreign investor. Uh, and therefore, it, it, very often the confusion is, oh, it's a make in India, is it, it is Atmanirbhar, but very clearly uh, it's, it's targeting all kinds of investments and therefore uh, foreign investors should be looking at this scheme, uh, especially when they're looking to diversify away from China and they should be looking at how uh, this scheme is actually uh, giving them uh, covering up for the cost disadvantage that they may face if they are shifting industries from uh, China to uh, China to India. Uh, it's a very clever scheme because um, uh, because it's WTO compliant. The WTO does not allow incentives, export incentives, to be given, but. Uh, if it is based on production, then it's permitted. And therefore it's designed in this manner that foreign investors, particularly foreign investors can take advantage of, uh, of this uh, scheme and not only target the domestic market, but also the export market. And uh, digging deeper into this, the PLI scheme, what we've tried to do is we've tried to map the items where there is export potential and which are which are the which of these actually falls under the PLI scheme and we find that many of these are actually falling in the PLI uh, under the PLI scheme. Uh, so clearly, this advantage can be uh, leveraged. Uh, my last point is on uh, supply chain resilience, which we've all talked about. Um, uh, India, uh, Japan, and Australia are part of the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. And we do know that uh, this, this is something that 
uh, is important and can, uh, the three countries can come together uh, to, uh, to strengthen their supply chains. And these supply chains, actually, if you look at something like the semiconductor manufacturing industry, we can see that not only does it have a direct value chain, it also has uh, supply, uh, it also has uh, other uh, support functions. And I, for instance, for wafer manufacturing, there could be about 39 countries that are involved. So one of the things that India and Japan can do is uh, increase, to expand its dialogue to include ASEAN so that, we, so that the countries can participate in deeper supply chains uh, making use of uh, the investment incentives that India has had to offer. With this, I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Thank you, Dr. Taneja. Your presentation was detailed in so far as the time permitted. And it certainly helped us to better understand how to take the uh, economic relationship between Japan and India forward. Thank you very much. We now have, we're running late, but we now have uh, Dr. Nagao, who will tell us something about China's territorial expansion plans and how Quad works. Welcome, Dr. Nagao. Thank you very much. Yes, the other two presenters are focusing on culture and economy. Now we need to talk about security. And uh, thank you very much for sharing my slide. And uh, so I will start uh, pro uh, my presentation. Um, indeed, uh, without the China factor, we cannot talk about India-Japan relation, especially the current uh, cooperation. So that's why I focus on this. So 20 Indian soldiers sacrificed their lives uh, in the India-China border in 2020 because of the China's territorial expansion. And uh, in the East China Sea, Japan suffered much. Uh, of course, uh, we haven't sacrificed lives, but uh, still we are facing China. So that's why the, we need analysis to China's territory expansion and what should we do? That's why the tema is three similarity of China's territory uh, expansion and how does the Quad work? So uh, uh, could you please change the slide? Yes, this one. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, firstly, we need to analyze the feature of the China territory expansion. Indeed, uh, they have three uh, features. In the, so not only in the East China Sea, not only in the India-China border, but also the South China Sea, the Taiwan, the South Pacific, or Indian Ocean, all of it. Indeed, the China's territory expansion has three features. First one is the lack of respect of international law. The inter in the East China Sea, China did not claim the Senkaku Island of Japan before 1971. But the attitude has changed. Uh, the Senkaku Island is a strategic location to pressure Taiwan and have potential oil reserves. In South China Sea, you know, the China has expanded its territory claim and ignore the verdict of the international court and build artificial islands. In the, when they start, uh, uh, start to, to build artificial islands, they said this is not military purpose, but China has started to deploy missiles or military planes on the artificial islands. Uh, that was what happened in the South China Sea. China continued to make the incursion in the Indochina border area, but uh, Tibetan exile government has said, uh, this area belongs to India. So this is another example. So they, it's a lack of respect of the international law is a fast feature of the China's territorial expansion. Second feature of the China's territorial expansion is expansion of the territorial claim where there are the power vacuums. For example, what happened in the South China Sea is a good example. Could you please change the slide? Thank you, this one. Yes, what happened in the South China Sea is the, uh, you can find in this slide. China occupies a half of the Palacer Island just after France withdrew from the region in 1950s. 1970s, 
one year after the U.S. withdraw from the Vietnam, China occupied the other half of the Paracel Island. In 1980s, when Soviet Union troops reduced the number in Vietnam, China expanded its activities in the Spratly Island and occupied six beaches. In 1990s, China occupied the mischief reef. Three years after U.S. troops withdrew from Philippines, so every time military power has a military balance has changed, and they find the power vacuum, they try to steal it. They are thief. This is the second feature. And could you please change the slide again? Yes, we need to talk about third feature. Attempt at economic dominance or other non-military method to expand influence abroad. So that is another feature. China has used a foggy infrastructure project known as the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, to expand its sphere of influence. Could you please change the slide? Yes, that one, so I uh, checked uh, by one in uh, China's activity around the Indian Ocean region. Uh, countries with a significant China's investment and debt are hesitant to criticize China, even when it's brought international rule. China has also been used the vaccine diplomacy of the COVID-19 to foster the goodwill among the recipient countries, but this is trap. So, no military method like infrastructure project or supply chain dominance, vaccine uh, diplomacy, serve as expand its influence, uh, influence and power. So even, even the developed country like Japan, Australia, uh, China used this method as an economic control. For example, when Australia insists on the international investigation to the identify the origin of COVID-19, China delays the process of the Australian products like wine, lobster to, um, to import. So dependence on China, dependence on China's market is a powerful weapon for Beijing to expand its influence and ultimately expand its territories. So could you please change the slide? Yes, that one. Yes, now we need to talk about who that, what should I do? Simply, we should do the opposite of what China wants. So firstly, respecting rule-based order based on current international law. That is very important. So for example, the joint statement of the Quad Summit Always mention the free and open rule-based order will meet the challenge in the rule-based maritime order, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because we try to emphasize how important rule-based order. And secondly, maintaining military balance. That is very important. Do not create a power vacuum. So to Quad countries need to feel the perceived power vacuum by maintaining military balance. So, but to do this, uh, we need to increase our defense budget. But this is not an easy task because uh, def increasing a defense budget means that we need the money. According to the Sweden think tank, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, so called CIPRI, Military expenditure database uh, they made uh, from 2011 to 2020, China increased its military expenditure 76%. During the same period, India increased 34%, Australia increased 33%, Japan increased only 2.4%, and the United States decreased its 10%. So decrease 18% and increase 76%. That is the reality. Of course, there's still the US spent three times bigger military expenditure than China. But uh, China is catching up. That is the reality. So increasing the defense budget is not easy task. If so, what should I do? What should I do? Could you please change the uh, uh, slide again? Thank you, that one. So we need to find a new method. Reorganize the security system itself is important. 
for a long time, left one in this right, hub and spoke system has maintained order in the Indo-Pacific. In this system, the hub is the United States, and many spokes are US allies, such as Japan, Australia, Taiwan, Philippines, Tha uh, uh, Thailand, South Korea, the, these countries in the Indo-Pacific. But the feature of the, this system is heavily dependent on US. But US can, US can get the all the information, but uh, Japan and Australia is not a lie, even if both are the US allies. That's why the, this is heavily depending on only US. So when the China is catching up to the United States, the system itself is losing the power. So current situation, so China's recent provocation indicate that the current system has not worked to dissuade its expansion. That's why the right one, the new system, new network-based security system is emerging. US allies and partners cooperate with each other and share the security burden with the United States and among themselves. For example, the Japan and Australia, in the hub and spoke system, Japan and Australia, both are US allies, but do not cooperate each other. Japan, Australia alliance is not exist. But in the network-based system, Japan and Australia should cooperate each other. In this case, we can uh, remember the how important the Quad. Yes, Jap India and Japan, India and Australia. And uh, of course, all of three countries cooperate with the United States. That's why this network-based system can work. And another network, for example, AUKUS, Australia, UK, US, or India, Australia, Indonesia, or India, Australia, France, or US, India, Israel, UAE, I mean, we call this, this I2U2, are creating a network of security cooperation now. The Quad is just one of the example, but very important one and vital one. Because Kuwait is a group of the great powers in the Indo-Pacific, except China. That's why this is very important. So if they use this system, how can, how can they share the security body with the United States? What can Kuwait do? Firstly, if the Kuwait country coordinate well, we can force China to defend multiple fronts at once. For example, the China won't attack the India. In this case, they concentrate their military expenditure in the India-China border, and their forces also deploy the border area. But still, China need to worry about the Pacific side because Japan and cooperate with India, or Australia and US also cooperate with India. So China need to share more security, and more military uh, budget or assets and deployed in the coastal line, the Pacific side, and they, and they need to prepare from the attack from the east side. So that's why the cooperation can work to maintain military balance. China need to worry the multi fronts at the same time. But in this case, the key is offensive capability. For a long time, you no know, country except the US possess enough capability to attack China. So that's why China can ignore the other side, for example, if China attacks uh, Taiwan, China can ignore the India. Uh, when China attacks India, China ignore the Pacific side. But uh, currently, the situation is changing. The, if the US, Japan, India, the all possess the long range strike capabilities, we, they are combined capability. Our combined capability force China to defend multiple fronts. So even if China decides to expand its territory, the in India-China border, uh, they need to still need to expand a certain amount of its budget and the military forces to defend itself against a potential attack from the US and Japan. So currently, all three countries, India, Japan, Australia, all planning to possess 1,000, 2,000 kilometer long range strike capabilities such as the cruise missile, F-35 jets, grind bombs, something like that. Indeed, not only these three countries, Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines, South Korea, also increased their strike arsenal, surface-to-surface surface -surface missile, uh, or the fighter jet uh, with uh, long-range bomb. bomb. These uh, really happened. For example, the, could you please change the slide? 
this is a list of the Japan is, Japan is planning to possess. And uh, this list is a little old. Recently, Japan is planning to import Tomahawk missiles from the United States. Could you change the slide? Uh, could I change the sl slide? This is Australia. And Australia also decided to import cruise missile from the United States. A Tomahawk cruise missile. And uh, next slide, please. This is a list of the missiles uh, India tested in the autumn in 2021 during the India-China uh, uh, face-off in the India-China border. But these missiles include many offensive capability, and that is very good, I think. So all of the three countries try to possess strike capability now. This is combined move. Could you please change this right? So what should they do? Thirdly, thirdly, the Quad need to integrate non-military effort into the overall strategy. Uh, this is very important because indeed, uh, China's threat is threat of money. Without the ample budget, China cannot modernize their military. Without the ample budget, China cannot uh, invest in infrastructure projects under the Belt and Road Initiative to create a debt in recipient and control this uh, recipient. So indeed, money is a very important part of the counter China strategy. So in case of the infrastructure project, in case of the, our dominance, uh, China's do dominance, uh, the economical area, what should they do? It's uh, very important. So indeed, uh, China is a top three level trading partner for US, in India, Japan, Australia, all of Quad. So, so if these countries depend on too heavily on trade with China, so our economy will be the hostage to it. So quad country cannot take a strong stance against China and rely heavily on trade with uh, it at the same time. So therefore quad country need to integrate our economic effort to reduce our reliance on China, decoupling or the risk diversifying of supply chain and uh, markets are necessary. In case of Japan, uh, could you please change the slide? Yes, uh, this is one of the examples uh, of the Japan's effort. This is the number of the people, uh, Japanese people staying in China. Yes, in 2012, the number was uh, 150,000. But 2020, 111,000. Yes, reducing nearly 28%. And at, at the same time, the number of Japanese people in the United States has increased. Yes, a little, but uh, yes, increased. 410,000 to 426,000. This means that Japanese are withdrawing from China and the uh, Japanese uh, uh, living in the United States maintain or increase a little. So Japan try to uh, diversify the risk or relocate their factories and uh, try to decouple. Uh, it is under process and just the beginning, but uh, Japan try to do that. And uh, could you pay, change the slide, please? This, this indeed the infrastructure issue uh, Japan has shown some efforts. For example, the, when China proposed Bangladesh, the Sonadia port project, only 25 kilometer distance, the Japan suggests counter project, Matabari port project. So Bangladesh eventually accepted Japan's Matabari port project because workable, because the Japan's efforts are big. So this is one of the Japan's effort to tackle China's uh, infrastructure project, which is a trap for the recipient. So yes, we have the limited budget. So uh, China's uh, size of money they prepared is very big and Japan cannot prepare the same size. But when we check, when the recipient, Bangladesh, checks the details, 
the recipient can understand China's project is uh, big money, but uh, not beneficial for them because they use the Chinese worker, because uh, their promise is too big. Uh, but real facts, they build uh, just infrastructure and the uh, local people cannot get the benefit. In case of Japan, Japan's project is workable, beneficial for locals, and very fair, not a trap. So that's why counter project is working, uh, even if the size of the budget is a little smaller than China's. So finally, I need to say China's aggressive territory expansion spurred uh, US to take the tough turn toward it and quit. Quad originally is uh, uh, suggested by the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan. Uh, so Quad must show how strong we are. So India, Japan, and Australia must cooperate more deeply with the US and stretch our partnership. And because China's expansion flow a predictable pattern, so in insisting the respect for the rule-based order or maintaining the military balance, or integrated military and non-military policy into the overall strategy are essential for the Quad uh, to achieve this goal. So now is the time uh, the, for the Quad and India and Japan to do that. That is my presentation. So thank you very much. The last one is uh, next slide. Please change the next slide. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Dr. Nagao, that was a fascinating and very important presentation. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And you have hit the nail on the head. This is probably the most important issue confronting Japan and India and Australia and indeed most of the world at present. Thank you again. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, a short break now uh, till two o'clock. Yeah, well, he's gone now. <laughs> Sorry. But because we were running late.
Uh, yeah, just just introducing. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce Dr. Sriram Cholia, who is the professor and dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs at Jindal Global University. Uh, he is chairing this session and will be the first speaker. Dr. Cholia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are we on air? Yes. Uh, the screen suggests that I'm not visible. Camera in Cooper. Should we put some more people? In Cooper. Ah, ah, yeah. I guess uh, in the interest of time, we'll just go ahead. Okay, greetings. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, unlike my TV show on Doordarshan, uh, an academic uh, seminar always has more space and room for longer discussions. So today we hope to have a, an in-depth understanding uh, and exchange of views on um, the Japan-India strategic partnership that has gone from strength to strength over the decades. Uh, it's obviously probably the most important uh, relationship uh, uh, India has in Asia uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to transform the region and to shape the emerging order here. So Japan and India, um, apart from the historical linkages and uh, the ties going back to centuries and millennia, the contemporary one is, under, uh, is, is, is um, underlined by this concept of a strategic partnership. So we, um, we're going to be talking about this comprehensive strategic, actually they call it special and global strategic partnership. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, as if you just go by the terminology, it has been upgraded from earlier uh, labels to now special global strategic partnership. And you may see in the years to come, the vision 2052 is the um, thought behind this uh, particular event. You may see that by 2052, we may have few more adjectives uh, and few more uh, prefixes added to make this special global strategic partnership even more important. And the reasons are in many ways very simple, but also they need to, uh, to be untangled and understood in full depth. And that's why we have this panel. The obvious and the most important is the convergence of visions for this region and for the Indo-Pacific. And uh, it goes without saying that um, Japan and India share uh, a common outlook and a common um, vision for how the regional order should be. And without that, there cannot be uh, special global uh, strategic partnership. Uh, it, it, the, the, the word global is also unique because India has many strategic partnerships uh, like the United States, Australia, within the region and beyond. United Arab Emirates, we have two dozen of them. But none of them has the term global uh, inserted in them except Japan. So clearly they intend to partner and do things that go beyond just the bilateral give and take and just the mutual um, exchanges. The idea is to shape the whole region and uh, even the global order. So to that extent, there is a higher level of ambition and depth to this relationship compared to most other. So, um, and we have a very interesting panel today talking about it, but I wanted to start by, before I introduce them, to lay the groundwork for this. Uh, this is, um, defining relationship because it helps to generate balance of power in Asia. And uh, we both of us believe that there must be a multipolar Asia, one with multiple power centers and one where there is uh, rules-based order and um, uh, regulated conduct of international relations. Not might is right or not um, an order based on um, uh, law of the jung or, uh, or the law of the jungle. So there is a uh, fundamental interest that both sides share in making sure that 
this region remains free from hegemony, free from uh, unipolar domination, and also one where we can work together to help uh, many other countries in the region as part of this global partnership. And um, the trust levels are high. There are no major conflicts of interest at all. And um, the shared uh, threat perception is also something that must be mentioned. I believe there's already been uh, a session in the morning about Quad and about China. Well, without uh, talking about China, there's no glue really that binds Japan and India. It can, if, if you only talk about the economic um, exchanges, uh, that's in itself not um, the full picture. The full picture has to speak about the counterbalancing effort against uh, uh, Chinese hegemony and how uh, Japan has become more uh, proactive in its um, foreign policy since uh, the late uh, great uh, Shinzo Abe and how that means that they are more involved in engaging with other partners to try and maintain this balance in the region um, and uh, to deter uh, aggression and hegemonic expansionism of China. Uh, of course, Japan uh, remains very closely entangled economically with, uh, J with China and the fates of the two countries uh, are umbilically linked due to the very high volumes of trade and investment they have between themselves. But what is interesting is the Japan-India growth story which is parallel to the Japan-China um, economic en uh, engagement. Japan does not have military engagement, but rather actually has military face-offs with China. With India, it's both economics and security together. And that's what marks this relationship apart from Japan's ties with China. And um, Japanese relations with China have been often uh, uh, portrayed as hot economics and cold politics. So the cold politics part is where India comes in. And uh, they are also looking to diversify from dependence on mainland China, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic uh, exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in supply chains. So India uh, is very much on the radar for Japan to expand uh, its um, corporate footprint as well. So economics plus security makes this... Um, truly special global strategic partnership. While on the Chinese, with the, with the Chinese, you can argue that they're very cagey about Chinese uh, military um, footprint and uh, authoritarian rule. In fact, uh, Japan has come out of the closet on the issue of human rights and democracy and has also become critical of China on the question of what they're doing in Xinjiang and Tibet. So uh, overall, uh, there has been a shift uh, Japan uh, does not believe that uh, it should play second fiddle to anybody and it believes that it's a power center in its own right and um, that although it has a security a long-standing alliance with the United States and although it uh, stays under the so-called uh, extended deterrence umbrella of the United States, um, it wants to also have independent relationships of its own that can fortify its position and help achieve the goal of this rules-based order and a multipolar uh, Asia. So in that context, you look at the figures and the data of the bilateral exchanges of Japan and India, it fits into this. Without this congruence, uh, you cannot really expect much of a um, forward movement on diversified supply chains, on um, joint military exercises, on um, uh, interoperability, Indo-Pacific outlook, Quad, all these, Japan and India are the building blocks. And uh, you may have also uh, noted that when um, Prime Minister Kishida visited India uh, for the first bilateral summit as Prime Minister with uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, um, the commitment of $42 billion of uh, additional FDI of Japan into India was announced. All these are huge. If you look at the volumes, India-Japan bilateral trade is not very high. It's only around $20, $20 billion per annum. But if you include the uh, FDI figures, it's enormous. And that's what makes this 
a very special relationship those of you who been to gujarat or who who worked in gujarat you know how much of a japanese footprint there has been uh, not now and all the way since when mr modi was chief minister uh, from 2001 to 2013 so uh, and now there are other uh, centers across the country where japan is investing japan india jointly are, are working in third countries like bangladesh myanmar sri lanka to name a few and um, there is an intent to also uh, combine and uh, work to better um, link southeast asia with the evolving regional architecture because japan is a big player in asean and in the pacific island nations it's got a major infrastructure and developmental partnerships there and it's looking for india to tag team with them in all these regions so that's what makes this a global partnership uh with few parallels um interestingly uh, south korea which is also a us treaty ally and uh, which is also has uh, american military bases has not reached the level of a uh, uh, global and special strategic partnership as japan has with india and it's worth asking why that is so and why south korea is not quite the player that we would like them to be unlike japan and the reasons are obvious it's because south korean ambiguity about china uh, is is uh, far more pronounced japan has greater strategic clarity about china uh, so if you look at it from that point of view uh, south korea is also heavily invested in china and dependent on the chinese market economically very very intertwined with china like japan but uh, uh, but nonetheless uh, is a smaller and has lesser ambitions of being a power center on its own and uh, it also needs chinese support to somehow handle the north korean problem so um, in that uh, if you look at the configurations we would hope that the india japan um, special global strategic partnership is a role model for many other um, such bilateral ties uh, that will be changing or 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 uh, or maintaining the order in the region and so i think it's not uh, an exaggeration to call the japan india relationship as a kind of a um, template for doing strategic partnerships if you were to write a book i in fact i am writing a book on uh, india's major strategic partnerships uh, chapter number 1 will be on japan and for obvious reasons so i think uh, the importance of japan has only grown with time and uh, all credit of course to abe san because without him i don't think we would have made so much progress because the japanese bureaucracy japanese um, foreign ministry and industry they tend to be a little conservative and not they don't make quick decisions and they're not very alert to changing situation they they have traditional approaches but i think uh, the period of shinzo abe was so um, transformative that he shook up the whole system and made them realize the importance of uh, teaming up with like minded countries number one being india so um, i think this partnership is now um, i think sky is the limit really and what we are doing now more advanced fields uh, even defense cooperation is coming on board now with japan and india uh, japan has um, many advanced uh, infrastructure projects like i mentioned the partnership for um, uh, quality infrastructure for example the cdri the uh, coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure all these are joint initiatives with japan and india and i think we have a uh, enormous potential to combine our uh, forces and to provide alternatives in this region to the chinese bri i think that's a larger project and i'm sure there are panelists who are going to be talking about it because the chinese belt and road initiative is a unilateral initiative and it is devoid of any consultation with any countries they go with big bags of money and throw it um, and try to buy loyalty and uh, gain strategic foothold in many parts of the world but japan and india when we come together first of all it's consultative and secondly we involve other players in decision making and that's why it's a uh, far more democratic and uh, uh, far more um, cognizant of the sovereignty and territorial integrity 
of smaller and weaker countries. So going forward, I would say that um, we must identify new areas. Already we have probably mined the worth of the potential, but there's much more uh, that needs to be done going forward. And uh, I hope the panelists will throw light on what more we could do apart from you know, the uh, economic and the security spheres. They, and within these spheres also, what further new areas uh, can emerge. So let me stop there and uh, invite uh, panelists to come in and uh, share their thoughts. We have uh, two panelists with us today. Um, Mr. Gautam Mukherjee, who is a journalist and a television personality, and he's uh, going to be speaking about bilateral and multilateral ties between our two countries uh, for the next 25 years, uh, what in India we call Amritakal and uh, what more uh, we can do together. And I also uh, would like to introduce the other panelists, Mr. Manish Chan, who is a well-known um, journalist and writer, and he is editor-in-chief of uh, India Writes, which is important web portal and also a magazine. And uh, he also speaks on um, strategic issues. So let me begin by inviting um, Mr. Mukherjee to share his thoughts on why this relationship is so special and where is it headed? Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chulia. The, uh, you know, I've been here since morning and it is very interesting to see how um, whenever a speaker has touched on either economics or strategic issues, they have more or less covered the same ground with different emphasis, but here I am projecting this for the next 25 to 30 years. 25 years means 100 years of Indian independence. 30 years is 100 years of the relationship with Japan. The diplomatic relations were established in 1952. So here, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor and pleasure to address you on this very special occasion of 70 years of diplomatic relations between India and Japan. My topic is to describe how the relationship will progress for the next 30 years. The changed security environment worldwide occasioned by an expansionist and aggressively commercial China has thrown up an urgent need to recast priorities. That the same 30 years will probably see the end of CCP-led communism in China and the emergence of independent nations in Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, and Tibet, as well as a democratic Han China contained within the Great Wall is perhaps difficult to imagine at this time. But let us remember the fate of the USSR once its economy no longer worked. But right now, the Chinese threat is very real. This, particularly in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, in the countries of South Asia and the Asia Pacific. It is this scenario that has placed both Japan and India in the relatively new quad formation alongside the US and Australia. In the short term, it is America that is facing the biggest geopolitical challenge as China is quite serious in its attempts to dislodge it as the number one power in the world. This will not succeed. It is clear now at the end of 2022 because the building blocks that China was using have fallen apart. These were close commercial relationships and supply chain arrangements with America and Europe that drove its economy at double digit growth in GDP for three decades. So much so that disentanglement is very difficult now because China is a manufacturing hub for many products with a wide array of raw materials and parts as well. But gradually, 
China turned unacceptably militarist and imperialist. It bankrupted several small countries around it, such as Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Laos, with expensive loans and 19th century style collaterals of land and assets. It has seized natural resources in Africa and is suffering a backlash there. China has established military bases in the Indian Ocean, attempted a Belt and Road campaign that is incomplete, another half-done project named String of Pearls designed to encircle countries like India in the oceans and so on. China is widely believed to have originated the COVID-19 pandemic out of a bioweapon laboratory in Wuhan that has severely damaged the world economy and killed millions of people around the world. China itself continues to suffer outbreaks, most recently in its capital, Beijing. Post-COVID, most of the world has decided to reduce its dependence on and trade with China. None of its globe-girdling ambitions can come to fruition now with badly impacted economies all around, including its own. China is now growing at less than 3% per annum and has gargantuan debt from its boom years past. Its people in the interior are literally hungry and outbreaks of protest are appearing even at its manufacturing plants. America is also determined to check Chinese ambition, a process started under President Trump and carried forward by the Biden administration. Most recently, America has refused access to its semiconductor technology and machines that make machines without which Chinese industry and its military cannot function. China's copycat industrial base is not very good at innovation. It wanted, therefore, to capture Taiwan for its semiconductor industry. But these two are run on designs by American design fabs from the US mainland and use American personnel in Taiwan as in China to operate them. Besides, capturing Taiwan will not let China at the designs of present and future chips ever finer in their composition and complexity of manufacture. Most recently, the most advanced chip manufacturing has been shifted to Arizona, even though it costs 50% more to do so. This is obviously American firm policy. Australia, a member of both Quad and AUKUS, the military alliance, with the US and Britain was for long a substantial trading partner of China. Today, it is increasingly a Western and NATO alliance base in the Pacific for US nuclear submarines, fighters, bombers, and military personnel with an eye on China. America is building nuclear submarines in joint venture with Australia as well. Australia is already protected under the US nuclear weapons umbrella, as is Japan. But can Japan do without its own nuclear weapons in the face of hostility from China, North Korea, though not really from Russia, despite its shifting alliances? Nuclear weaponized China in retaliation to this independent policy has imposed punitive and some say self-defeating sanctions on Australian exports of raw materials, food, coal, etc., to China. It seeks to control access to the South China Sea, which it claims in its entirety, and through which 80% of Australian trade passes. China has not recognized the International Court of Justice ruling at The Hague to treat the South China Sea as an international waterway. Similarly, China claims the Japanese Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea as there are indications of rich oil resources in the area. 
It routinely menaces Japanese civilian shipping and fishing boats in the region with its Navy and has its ally North Korea fire missiles into Japanese waters. Australia, as part of a new commercial and security reorientation, is well on its way towards a free trade agreement with nuclear weaponized India as a replacement market in Asia. This even as China has attempted a walk back after government changes in Australia. This FTA with Australia comes years after the one India signed with Japan in 2011, since vastly enhanced in scope by the Strategic and Global Partnership Agreement of 2015, which has brought about a paradigm shift. Nevertheless, the FTA with Japan in 2011 eliminated tariffs on 90% of Japanese exports to India, such as electrical appliances, and 97% of imports into Japan from India. The agreement also allowed Japanese companies to control stakes in Indian companies and set up franchises. However, because of protection afforded to vulnerable sectors in both countries, the FTA of 2011 has not done any wonders. In 2010, Trade between Japan and India was limited to a modest $15 billion and represented just 1% of Japan's global trade. By FY22, things were not much better. Indian exports to Japan stood at a paltry $6.2 billion and its imports were a very modest $14.4 billion. The Indo-Japanese FTA is therefore overdue for a review Though Japanese investment in India's infrastructure has dwarfed the bilateral trade figures. In contrast, even with strained relations with China and several operational bans on Chinese investment, the Indo-Chinese bilateral trade stands at $100 billion per annum now, but mostly in China's favor. India's largest exports at present are to the US at $76 billion in FY22, representing 18% of its total exports. Perhaps the big change in terms of Indo-Japan trade volumes will come as Japan relocates a substantial portion of its manufacturing from China to India and the domestic and export markets it will open up. India is working fast to remove logistical and infrastructure bottlenecks and is offering incentives in order to facilitate this. The Japanese government too is offering incentives to Japanese firms who might consider relocating to India or Bangladesh from China. But it is a lot easier said than done. Japan has hot economic ties with China despite the ever cooling politics, some of the frostiness as a consequence of American persuasion. Japan normalized its diplomatic relations with China in 1972, again at American prompting in the Nixon years and marks 50 years of business with China this year as well. Currently, the world's second and third largest economies China is Japan's biggest trading partner with a total volume of trade grown 113 times since 1972 to 38.4 trillion yen, uh, about 188 billion US dollars. According to a survey conducted by the Japan External Trade Organization in 2021, covering 679 Japanese firms with heavy investments in China, only 3.8% plan to shrink their operations in China or relocate in the next few years. Another report says about 135 Japanese companies are in the process of shifting out of China. Most and are more interested in mitigating the fallout of US-China trade wars on their own operations. 
Meanwhile, under the Indo-Japanese Special Strategic and Global Partnership 2015 and its vision statement till 2025, the key development has been generous Japanese financing for all sorts of infrastructure projects and joint venture manufacturing. Some of these have come up along the specially designated corridors, such as the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, the DMIC, alongside the NH8. This also provides outlets and a market for Japanese know-how manufacturing and technology applied to the establishment and modernization of Indian railways, including rolling stock, metro rail systems, high-speed trains, roads, ports, dedicated railway freight corridors, and so on. There is a mechanism for an annual summit between the two prime ministers to review progress, add new dimensions, and maintain momentum. There is a provision for Indo-Japanese participation in the annual Malabar Naval Military Exercises with a view to keeping international shipping, sea lanes free and clear. There are provisions for military to military talks, Coast Guard to Coast Guard cooperation, including both security and commercial exploitation of Indian waters in peninsular India, the so-called blue economy. There are also Air Force to Air Force talks and scope for comprehensive discussions on defense policy. There is a provision for joint development of military equipment, including amphibian planes. There is a roadmap for cooperation in the development of nuclear power plants. Japan is and will continue to participate in Indian initiatives for Make in India, Digital India, Skill India, Clean India, and the development of smart cities. India is one of the largest receivers of loans from Japan's Official Development Assistance, ODA, in addition to other banks and institutional financing over the Shinzo Abe years. This, as the Japanese economy tries to shake off years of domestic recession via its overseas manufacturing, investments, and projects. India is also implementing an FTA with the UAE and is negotiating one with Britain. The Australian Parliament passed its Indo-Australian FTA only this week. It is going to be a comprehensive strategic partnership, said Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. The IT sector in India will be the biggest gainer, said Indian Commerce Minister Piyush Goel, as the service sector benefits hugely from such FTAs. Indian pharmaceuticals will receive fast-track approvals through the Australian regulatory system. The agreement will provide duty-free access to the high per capita income Australian market for over 6,000 broad sectors, including textiles, leather, furniture, jewelry, and machinery. India will be able to import cheaper raw materials and intermediate goods. Industrial cooperation will help provide new job opportunities in both countries. Food, beverage, and consumer items from Australia will offer wider choice at attractive prices to the Indian consumer and give Australia access to India's massive domestic market. There are good pointers here on how Japan can revamp aspects of its domestic economy in addition to security policies going forward. For many years after 1952, when India established diplomatic relations with Japan, there was little going on between the two countries, even though the relationship was always cordial. Indians remember fondly the help extended by Japan to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose and the INA during World War II. Japan set course to become one of the fastest growing post-war economies closely allied to the United States. India chose a socialist path post-independence in 1947 and found itself rather closer to the Soviet Union and many countries in the third world coming out from under colonialism. India tried in the Nehru, Mao, Zhou and Lai era to forge a close relationship with China, including tamely agreeing to the Chinese annexation of Tibet 
and pushing China's claim to become one of the five permanent members with veto powers at the UNSC. But it was not to be. Appeasement of China did not work then, and it does not work now. Today, India refuses to normalize commercial ties as long as China menaces it along the long LAC. And it stands resolute on the borders, determined to defend Indian territory. The ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war in Europe, the first with such wide involvement since World War II, will change many positions and alliances the longer it goes on. India is, however, like Japan, largely insulated from its effects. Today, as we speak, India is advancing towards becoming the third largest economy in the world by 2028 or 2030. This is a massive achievement fueled by the fastest growth rate amongst major economies at around 7% per annum. India is adding $400 billion to its GDP every year now, according to Morgan Stanley, with the best post-COVID recovery amongst major economies. This is happening despite its vast population of nearly 1.5 billion that will grow to 1.7 billion before it begins to decline post-2070. Japan, by way of contrast, has a declining, declining and aging population. It has therefore somewhat loosened its immigration, visa, and citizenship laws recently. Japan has proved itself adept at developing, at developing its gaming industry. And here again, it could think of joint venturing with Indian IT professionals. Today, India is food surplus and is rapidly developing its industrial base via in-house innovation and joint ventures with many countries such as Japan, France, Israel, the United States, Taiwan, and Russia. Now, every bilateral and multilateral fora wants India and sees it as a reasonable and benign influence. India has achieved this stature and growth without threatening any other country or breaking international protocols, even though it is a nuclear triad weapons power. It has not aided illegal nuclear proliferation like Pakistan, North Korea, and China. In just a few years, the Indian economy, which is, which is at fifth position right now, will overtake that of Japan, making it a worthy joint venture partner. Joint venturing with India for military development and manufacture in India could very well provide the multi-billion dollar answer to consumption in both countries as well as export. India credits Japan for its metro rail system all over the Indian cities, the bullet trains, extensive collaboration in the automotive and auto components field, starting with India's first modern car in the 1980s, the Maruti 800 from Maruti Suzuki, <coughs> which came before the arrival of Honda, Toyota, and Suzuki on its own. The Indian appliances and consumer electronics industry, ACE, has already become one of the fastest growing markets in the world. It is slated to double to about $20 billion by 2025. It already has a strong Japanese presence, which can grow further. Future engineering collaboration has immense promise in robotics, drones, automation, alternate energy developments, including nuclear power generation. India is thorium rich, but could probably use Japanese help to develop state-of-the-art thorium reactors. Today, India offers a vast domestic market, multiple opportunities for joint ventures, research and development, supply chain relocation, great innovation via startups and unicorns. Many other countries besides Australia, like South Korea, New Zealand, 
all the Pacific, Asia Pacific countries in the littoral need to be protected and cooperate under a quad plus arrangement. Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Bangladesh, Nepal are all likely candidates. China has border and territorial disputes with 19 countries. It seems certain that economic cooperation between Japan and India will prosper as India grows into a $12 trillion economy or more within a decade. With the economic decline of China, there is no alternative. Now Britain and the EU are ranged against China too. The last bastion of Chinese German trade is also wiggling out of the Chinese grasp. There is no way forward for the Chinese economy to strengthen unless the CCP communist leadership becomes history. What does India have in common with the Japanese that goes back centuries? Buddhism, of course. There are many Buddhist sects in Japan, as there are in Tibet. Both Gaya, where Gautama the Buddha attained enlightenment, owes its betterment as a place of pilgrimage, largely contributed to by the Japanese pilgrim. It is revered by monks and laity alike. The Buddhist sect former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe belonged to was not pacifist, and he was an outspoken advocate of rearmament and a repeal of Japan's pacifist constitution. However, the bulk of Japanese people in 2022 do not want to see the country take a militarist turn. This is a challenge for Prime Minister Kishida and his successors, given the ground realities. With India no longer an economic laggard, the time to prove that India and Japan can become an economic powerhouse together has arrived at last. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. I think that's quite a comprehensive uh, review of the past and also some future directions for this crucial uh, partnership. So we got some sense of what could be new areas in which Japan and India can cooperate. Um, often people say that um, the people-to-people -people linkages are still weak, but uh, I hope that that's one area we can also improve. I mean, the for example, the diaspora is not huge. Indian diaspora in other parts uh, of the world and even in, uh, in Asia is bigger than what we have in Japan. And um, educational exchanges, um, mobility across the two countries, these kinds of things uh, need to also grow perhaps apart from the cultural linkages. Let's uh, also now bring in uh, Manish Chand on this matter. Uh, he's been writing and covering this key relationship for a long time. And uh, Manish, uh, there has been a lot of um, emphasis by the two leaderships that this is a kind of a defining partnership and that uh, there is, uh, as I said, the sky sky uh, is the limit. But your thoughts on what we have achieved so far and what more needs to be done? Because uh, obviously there's much that the bilateral relationship has going for it. But uh, what are the new avenues? And if you can also throw light on those and uh, how do you see this going forward for the next decade or longer? Because the this event is uh, for the next 30 year horizon until 2052. And uh, as Mr. Mukherjee said, uh, India will uh, overtake Japan and become the second largest, uh, sorry, the third largest economy in the world uh, in near time. But then Japan remains a formidable player. And how, 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 how what are the other complementarities and convergences between our two countries. And uh, I'd also like you, if you can talk about the demographic decline uh, problem of Japan and, and how India figures in there, because they have not been very open to immigration historically, but now given the existential uh, problem they are facing with the population uh, aging and decline, 
is there something we can also do if not uh, long longer term immigration but also you know shorter term uh, movement of workers across the two uh, jurisdictions in ways that will keep the japanese economy and the society vibrant uh, going uh, to later part of the 21st century so just a few uh, initial thoughts and of course your own presentation please uh, uh, thank you dr cholia for for introducing me and setting the canvas and thank you uh, gautam also for laying out the canvas a very big picture view of the relationship uh, you know a uh, historical background and where we are and where we need to go has been broadly captured uh, by gautam in his magisterial address uh, now i will focus primarily on the future because i believe firmly that uh, when we talk about india japan relationship as it's a, it's of course the defining relationship but it's the relationship of the future what has been achieved is commendable but the real action uh, lies in the future in the next few years in the next few decades so that's why the vision 250 although it's a very long range vision you know uh, i wonder how many of us will still be around then uh, hopefully so but uh, you know uh, it's it's a very robust vision uh, uh, right now uh, when we look at the current play of relations uh, fortunately, there are no contentious issues. We don't have something to remove. The last albatross was a nuclear issue, which got uh, resolved with the nuclear deal, uh, the signing of the nuclear deal. So now we really don't have any major issue to address, as in contentious issue. Uh, the focus is on doing more and more. As they say in Hindi, ye dil mange more. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the general sentiment, because in all the areas, uh, we have to raise the ambition. We have to have a concrete uh, uh, plan ahead and to achieve that, you know. So let me just uh, outline, uh, you know, some of the, some of my thoughts. Uh, one is, you know, I want to talk about what I consider uh, the three fundamental C's of India-Japan relations, uh, which is first is commerce, uh, connectivity and culture, you know, these three uh, pillars and uh, on the other side, in the geopolitical side, there is the fourth C, which is China, the elephant in the room, you know. And so, you know, India-Japan relations uh, partnership, uh, which is uh, now global, special, strategic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Cholia was saying, you know, we don't have so many, the, the fact that, you know, global, special, strategy, each of these words have a certain meaning and content. Uh, and the only relationship comparably, which I can think in terms of closeness, uh, with the Russia relationship. Of course, Russia-India relation partnership has is now uh, under scrutiny for different reasons. Uh, uh, so the fundamental point is this, that Japan has become India's preeminent development partner, given the kind of money it has pledged, ODA it has pledged, and also India's preeminent strategic partner. I would say, of course, US is the, the most important partner, but in terms of the comfort label, in terms of all the recent uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, geoeconomic developments have driven uh, India and Japan closer and closer, and the web of convergence is widening by the day. So uh, building on that, you know, when we are talking, uh, when we are looking ahead, when we look into the future, uh, as pointed out earlier, by 2050 or so, India will, uh, going by current trends, India will definitely be the second world's second largest economy. It will take over Japan, I think, in the next 10 years or even much before that. Uh, so economically, we'll have more weight. And what that means is that that gives us also more strategic heft. It gives us more weight in the international system. Uh, because unless we have a $10 trillion economy to be talking about uh, a meaningful international role would be uh, more rhetorical than grounded in reality. And we are heading there. So by 2050, we will have more economic power, and so will Japan, despite the slow rate of growth, because they have a, already got a, got a solid base, Japanese economy. So even if it grows by 2%, 3%, 4%, it's adding quite a lot. So what it opens up, uh, you know, the opportunities it open uh, up are immense. On the economic side, when we are looking at the current volume of trade, I don't think it's a tip of the iceberg. We can do so much more. We need to also rejig our, you know, 
uh, free trade agreement we have. And I think the, there are already discussions on that front. Investment. Uh, now, investment is a major issue that needs to be addressed upfront. Because although uh, uh, you know uh, more in Japanese investment are coming, the narrative of India still has to catch on in Japan among the business community, and there are many factors for that. Uh, one is you know a notorious uh, uh, red te uh, red tapism, you know bureaucracies, uh, also the way of doing business, ease of doing business. We are moving up, but there is so much more Japanese want, you know. Uh, then at the same time, when we're talking about attracting more Japanese investment, uh, we also have to look about the cultural factor. You know, Japanese businesses operate in a cultural system. They need certain facilities. You know, language is a, is a, is a barrier, but also the larger ecosystem, you know, cultural ecosystem. By that, I mean, you know, wellness and other things that are important to them, you know, wherever they have gone. Uh, so, uh, so culturally also we need to work on and here, and we'll talk, I'll talk uh, more about culture a little later, uh, but this factor needs to be kept in mind that, you know, we cannot work on the economic uh, partnership in silo. It has to merge with the, with the larger vision of strategic and even the cultural connections. Now, uh, on, the, on the investment side, uh, Japanese, this year has been, by the way, a very unique year for India-Japan relations. You know, we had uh, the first visit by Japanese Prime Minister Kishida in March, and then we have a visit by Prime Minister Modi to Japan in, uh, you know, for the Quad Summit. He also had a meeting with uh, Mr. Kishida. I, I, was, I happened to be there in uh, Tokyo in May, and then uh, Prime Minister went for the funeral of Abe-san, and uh, now we are here, you know, mapping the way ahead. So all very, uh, uh, you know, one of the pillars of uh, India-Japan relations, the man who actually transformed it. Uh, Abesan is no more with us, but you know, I was at a, at a reception at the Japanese embassy yesterday. Uh, the new ambassador of Japan to India is a, uh, is a, is a former uh, secretary to the prime minister, Abe. And he was talking about how Abe was such a factor, you know, uh, in, in bringing uh, India and Japan together. And uh, similarly, the new prime minister is firmly committed to, to, to continue and accelerating that that uh, process. So talking about this year, you know, not in terms of just high label visits and symbolism, 5 trillion yen investment that was pledged by uh, Prime Minister Kishida in the March visit is a very ambitious target. And this further revalidates, you know, Japan's emerging status as India's preeminent development partner. Uh, so economically, we are doing uh, okay, we are doing well, but our potential is so much more. And as our economies, especially Indian economy, the weight of Indian economy grows, uh, you know, we will be uh, doing more. So when we talk about uh, future economically, the, we will be more interconnected. Uh, talking about the future areas, some of the future areas that comes to my mind. Uh, one is uh, where uh, base has already been uh, laid, which is on the defense side, you know, the mutual logistics pact, AXA, that has already been done, that paves the way for uh, you know, acceleration, int intensification of defense and strategic partnership. Uh, Japan, as you know, has a pacifist constitution. Uh, so it continues to uh, have this internal debate about whether to export weapons or not. That's why a long-standing amphibious uh, aircraft deal is still hanging. So it is about their internal system. Uh, uh, once it sorts out that system, I think, because Japanese equipment is very good, really high quality. Japanese tanks are in fact better than UK tanks. So no, there is a, a lot that can be done. And here, the, I think the, the big frontier is joint manufacturing of defense equipment, uh, technology transfer. Uh, and I gather that there is already a lot of discussion happening behind the scenes, and we'll see some concrete uh, results there. On, now, another thing that will propel India and another major, major factor geostrategically uh, will propel India and Japan into a quintessential partnership is the rise of China. Uh, China is, uh, you know, Gautam spoke about decline of China economic, uh, but China is going to be a very formidable player, uh, you know, rattling the in international system, you know, posing a major, major challenge to the international system. We have 
Uh, recently, Xi Jinping was elected for a third term as president. It looks like he's president for life or going to be the most powerful leader. So when we talk about 2050, for all you know, Xi Jinping may still be around or, or, or someone who has Xi Jinping ambitions will take over. Uh, so what it means is that uh, in geopolitical term that we will continue to face and confront an increasingly assertive and a belligerent China, which is itching for its place in the, under the sun. Uh, it has sensed a relative decline of the United States and uh, all be in India feel that a moment has come under the sun. Moment is arrived, but China also feel that this is their this is their moment, despite everything, and uh, which was very clear, visible in the the party Congress. Uh, only a very confident uh, power can claim the president can claim that you know uh, we will not restrain from the option of uh, invading Taiwan. So the reunification of Taiwan. Uh, the reunification and what they call national rejuvenation, the Chinese dream will be the world's nightmare for quite some time. And one has to deal with that. What it means uh, for India, Japan and the Quad partners is they have to be constantly on their feet to, to reinvigorate their uh, strategic partnership, uh, bolster Quad and other similar mechanisms. So here it comes that India, China, India, Japan uh, partnership in multilateral forums will grow deeper in days to come, in years to come. And Quad, of course, is going to be a major focus uh, forum for this. Uh, G7, for all you know, when we're talking about the future, India could be the G8 or G9. You know, G7 at some point has to expand. We have been regularly going to that summit. But since we're taking a very long term range vision, it's possible that we are there. G7, and anyway, we are being invited. We are in, an important outreach partner. And uh, the third, of course, and the most important for us right now, uh, given that we India has G20 presidency, a G20 will be the forum again on which India and Japan. So India, Japan will work very closely in international forum. And recently you may have seen US and France expressing support uh, for uh, 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 the claim of India and Japan Brazil for permanent seat in the Security Council. So when we are talking about 52, if we still don't have a permanent seat, then it will never, never happen. Uh, whatever, you know. So if in the next 30 years we don't get a permanent seat or next 10 years, 15 years, and, uh, you know, then the, the world order, all these international institutions will be truly anachronistic. They already are. And I think this is another area where India and Japan have to pull in their collective weight to to accelerate reform of international global governance architecture, including the United Nations Security Council. Now, uh, just very briefly about uh, connectivity and Indo-Pacific, which is the buzzword, uh, you know, shaping free and open Indo-Pacific. These words sound deceptively simple, but there is a lot here because keeping sea lanes of navigation free is, a, is an onerous, it's a, it's a challenging task, especially with Chinese assertiveness. So shaping a free and open Indo-Pacific will remain a challenge, which will bring India and Japan together in a tighter uh, strategic embrace. So these are some uh, areas I would like to speak more, uh, but uh, just also focus. Yeah, one last point I want to mention, which uh, Dr. Cholia spoke about uh, very briefly, but which I consider very integral to the debate. Uh, when we are talking about the future of India-Japan relations, I think the very big gap here is uh, people to people and cultural context. I think this, uh, does, this makes the relationship less real somehow or other. For all the uh, upswing in trade and investment, uh, there is a lack of knowledge, you know. There is a massive knowledge information deficit uh, 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 among the people of India and Japan I don't know how many Indians know about contemporary Japan, you know. When we are thinking about Japan, we are talking about bullet trains, we are talking about Hitachi, probably some of us are thinking of Mount Fuji. Uh, but uh, beyond that, there isn't really much. Uh, similarly, uh, when Japanese are thinking about India, they still have a rather exoticized view of India. Uh, and that is because there isn't much, language is a barrier. But you know, if language was a barrier, you know, so many Chinese tourists would not be traveling. Uh, so I think that's a lazy excuse. We really need to do something about it. 
also the uh, uh, and, and and given that there is a solid base you know buddhism the hindu gods and goddesses are there in you know japanese temples all over uh, there is yoga there is the rest so there is a, a the basic spiritual and cultural connect already but we need to translate culture industry collaboration is what i will propose in a more systematic manner because it's easy to talk about you know normally if you look at it when we talk about people to people cultural connection they are like footnotes in a joint statement towards the end somewhere because it has to be accommodated it's not such a big priority i think we need to change that uh, another thing uh, which we're talking about the demographic factor which is this that india is an overwhelmingly young society and it will remain so in the foreseeable future japan is already aging so i think we need to complement each other they need us and for that mobility agreements and all that those you know the the procedural things need to be sorted out and you know this is something very interesting which is told to me by the famous uh, japanese scholar who was abe's secretary for a very long time uh, uh, professor taniguchi and he says that you know on one level if you uh, if indians are from earth then we japanese are from mars he's saying that we are two different kind of people in some ways the japanese are very placid that's why things don't move fast there you know and he said you're a restless bunch of people i'm quoting from an interview i did japanese are not so the country is aging it is risk averse and 18 in 80 year old person cannot take risk i think that sums it up you know so japanese have a certain system they follow and it takes a lot to change the narrative so i think we need to invest more in changing the narrative about india about contemporary india also uh, bringing people culturally together uh, because uh, without that the the kind of transformation kind of expansion of relations we want which is very much in our interest it's a very mutually empowering and mutually enriching uh, partnership and uh, and above all i would also want to highlight one last thing about which is where i'm ending is this that it's a relationship of equal democracies this is very important it may sound like a cliche but it is not as you know there's a japanese uh, proverb which says that don't walk behind me i may not lead don't walk in front of me i may not follow just walk beside me and be my friend so i think this is the spirit of equal friendship equal partnership which will steer india japan partnership onto higher trajectory higher and higher as we go along thank you so much thank you thank you manish uh, yeah you know the um, similar stature in the international order both uh, being uh, kind of middle powers of course india has a potential to become a great power uh, japan for obvious reasons for size and also due to the demographic decline is very unlikely to become a great power ever uh, but uh, at present this equality is a very interesting point uh, is brought out there is a sense of that nobody talks down to the other and it's really um a very democratic kind of a uh, uh, special global partnership strategic partnership where there is no uh, big brother and small brother so in that sense um, you know when uh, abe and modi the famous bromance was in its bloom you know you could see that they were really uh, the comfort level was at another level simply because these are two countries which are structurally similar in the international order and therefore there is no asymmetry of power or any insecurity about each other and that's what makes a huge difference and when you bring in china it's a totally different ball game because of the asymmetry um so i think we've had a wonderful uh, presentations and we'd like to open up to the audience now and uh, invite some questions uh, addressed to any one of us about uh, japan india relationship and where it's going please just raise your hand and feel free to uh, join us in the conversation any thoughts on the strategic partnership yes please thank you now all three of you as well as the previous uh, political economic 
participation. Now in talking about strategic partnership, China has been a very important concern. Now from a anti-China point of view, though China possesses, possesses a challenge, now can this strategic partnership can be imagined in a much more affirmative way? And for example, think of, uh, you know, Indo-China, Indo-Japanese uh, partnership for the sake of global peace. And, you know, now in what way, is there any way, you know, behind, you know, beyond this uh, anti-China? So China is a problem so or challenge. So my this is my first query. Secondly, in uh, thinking about this geopolitical uh, strategy, now, what is the role of uh, other dimensions? You know, for example, this geopolitical strategies need to be accompanied by much more cultural cooperation, people-to-people -people interaction, and, and knowledge of each other. You know, what is the knowledge and realization of Japan in terms of Indian people? Professor Chaulia, you are in a university. Look at, you know, what is the university engagement in learning about Japanese society. So what would be view, your view on developing this kind of capacity, which can foster this uh, strategic relationship in a different way? Thank you, uh, good questions. Uh, the first one about, is this a, actually a negative coalition against China or is there a positive agenda? Uh, you know, I'll take you back to a very landmark speech uh, given by Prime Minister Modi at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore in 2018, outlining India's vision for the Indo-Pacific. And one of the key phrases he used was that our vision for Indo-Pacific, it's a positive vision and an outlook. It is to create a, a different regional order. It is not simply to counterbalance China or to push them back. So um, the, when we say rules-based order, when we say, uh, you know, more greater, more balanced order, when we say, um, uh, you know, one way international law, unclause and all these things should uh, prevail, we are not just talking about, uh, you know, countering China in a crude way, but about actually building a different regional architecture. So I think there is a bigger purpose uh, but I must say that uh, strategic partnerships which, which do not have a shared threat perception are not really strategic partnerships. So you can't deny the fact that China, the, the, the fourth C that Manish was talking about and uh, Gautamji was also mentioning, uh, without that, I'm sure that this would just be a transactional relationship. You see, when, what is the difference between transactional and strategic? Transactional means, okay, you know, you, you, you give me some and I give something and we'll both benefit maybe materially, you know. So to go to a next level, you do need um, shared threat perception and a convergence that goes beyond just, uh, you know, trade and commerce. So I think uh, China factor cannot be denied, but I think the point is well taken that the two countries are not here solely to uh, to 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 push back China, but we have a broader region. I mean, for example, Japan, India are also cooperating in Africa, uh, in the development sector. Japan, India have Asia Africa Growth Corridor project. Now there, it's not so much to counter China. You know, it is because we feel we have a responsibility to the global South, and we feel we can jointly do things that will um, uh, increase, enhance our own influence in the uh, in the rest of the developing uh, world so i think uh, th there are elements where you can say that suppose there was no china threat we would still be doing things together but i don't think it would be called strategic in that case it would not reach that level uh, the other point about people to people uh, request or maybe on any of these uh, gautam ji you want to come in on this uh, why are we not doing enough uh, in terms of cultural linkages and why is, uh, is that element still weak? Uh, and why are we still strangers at the level of societies? Well, I think, you know, at last there is some parity in terms of stature between a Japan and a resurgent India. At this point in time, yes, there, there are a lot of cliches. Uh, the first part in the morning, 
uh, there was a lady there who practices, a Japanese lady, practices Bharat Natyam, yoga, uh, you know, and 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 has a great deal of knowledge of Hinduism and so on. But this is uh, like a swallow in summer, you know. Uh, what you need is uh, indeed what you suggested. Uh, you need faculties of Japan studies in uh, in their place. They need faculties of Indian studies. You've got them in America, so why not in Japan? Because we are now important, our, as, as, as Dr. Chaulia just pointed out, uh, we better hang together or hang separately. It's, it's a matter of definitely dealing with China on the one hand, and therefore it is good to know each other's language. People were learning Chinese. There are many Indians who learn Chinese for business. So similarly, uh, we need to learn about them, their language, uh, they need to learn about us, and uh, it can be can be institutionalized and formalized. It's just that, really speaking, this new upgrade is only a few years old from 2015. So we have a long way to go. If we're talking about this period forward, 25 to 30 years, maybe that is the time to get it done. Uh, can uh, I have a question? Just, uh, comment on uh, my comment is to Gautam uh, Gautam uh, Mukherjee. <clears throat> you said about that COVID. You brought a reference to the COVID. The uh, actually China was responsible for the outbreak of the COVID in Wuhan. Do you know that Wuhan project was financed by Obama administration in US? Antonio was the coordinator. So do you think that both China and US were responsible equally for the outbreak of COVID? Thank you. I, I would only request that we focus on the Japan-India relationship. I mean, that's kind of an aside, but you may still respond briefly. Yeah. yeah, well, no, I don't agree that they are equally responsible. Yes, they they had a bioweapon investment in Wuhan, the Americans. They also have similar ones, it is said, in Ukraine. Uh, this is part and parcel of another string to the bow of security arrangements. So the fact is, it leaked, and it caused devastation all around the world. It's not the development of bioweapons alone. It's bad enough, but that's a separate uh, exercise. But if you're going to have in a bioweapon lab 20 different things that can kill the world in 20 different ways, that's one thing. But if it gets out of the lab and into the lives of people, to the extent that it is Still, the rest of the world has recovered. We're not wearing masks. But uh, China's in a complete lockdown in many places. So uh, definitely the, the, the responsibility lies with he who leaked it. You would like to come back to the Japan yeah. question yeah. about the linkages. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's true. I mean, on the university's front also, I can tell you that we have been at Jindal, we've been trying to hire Japanese faculty. We have, uh, you know, more than 30 foreign nationalities among our full-time faculty, but not a single Japanese. We used to have one who, who left due to personal reasons. So what has happened is, and, and with partnerships also, uh, we have a few like uh, Waseda and uh, Keio and with uh, Ritsumeikan and all these things. But the mobility of students is usually one way, like Indian students uh, who have an interest in Pacific studies are going in that direction, but very rarely do we get Japanese students coming here even for a full semester, leave alone for a full degree program. And a lot of this has to do with the English uh, you know, difficulty that many of them face. And secondly, we don't have enough champions for India there in their university systems. I was recently on a TV show on Sunset TV about Japan, and we had... Uh, Professor, I think Rajiv Shah, he's based uh, in a Japanese university there. And he was making this point that 
um, even though he's been there for probably more than a decade or so, uh, there just isn't enough of a, you know, you need um, advocates and chaperones for India there to be able to bring along uh, students and to make them see India and to learn about India in a more systematic way. So occasionally you will see some PhD students here doing some, you know, in a very uh, niche areas, but there's not much of a mass exposure um, of Japanese uh, uh, students and uh, academics and intellectuals to India. And this is surprising because you go back in time uh, to Tagore and uh, that era, you know, the Pan-Asianism and all these things. You had um, uh, Okakura and all these great uh, Japanese thinkers who very much were in sync with uh, and who used to interact a lot. But we do less of it these days. And you don't have grand civilizational projects bringing Japanese and Indian thought together. I mean, these kind of conferences are good, but we need probably much bigger and sus sustained efforts at the level of ICCR and other institutions to be able to harness this. I hope there's an ICCR chair in Japan. Uh, there, there is, is there, there, is. Is, there but is. But we'll need a lot more than that. Uh, we'll need a lot of mobility on both sides. Uh, Manish, please. Uh, you know, you are absolutely right. And I have some interesting statistic to share. You know, shortly before the pandemic, I'm told, the number of Indian students studying and working in Japan was only 16. Can you believe it? One six. One six. And number of Indian students enrolled in Japanese higher education institution, less than 2000 at some point, even fewer than the number of Uzbekistan sent to Japan. Okay. Now, what it means is that, you know, as you were saying that we need champions for India, you know, and I, I had spoken my visits to Japan and some of these professors, I mean, one of the way to do is to incentivize, you know, economic incentive, uh, you know, give Indian scholarships uh, because language remains a major barrier and there's no doubt about it. And that needs to be addressed. And, uh, and, and the Japan is a rich country. It can certainly do that. because It's a small investment to make in the future of the relationship. And as you know that, you know, one of the reasons why the India-US relations were grown and grown despite, uh, you know, political tensions in the earlier days of the Cold War and all, was this robust people-to-people -people contact, you know, around uh, how many, three, 300,000? Now, now we have 4 million. Yeah, 4 diaspora. million diaspora. And at any time, there are 200, 100 or 200,000 Indian students. So that becomes a study pillar. And we don't have that. A diaspora, lack of a diaspora is one thing. Uh, so this uh, really needs to be promoted at uh, both label. And, you know, we just cannot talk about it. You need to come up with incentives, our cultural institutions, our uh, higher education, you know, you at university label. And uh, in, in this regard, you know, the event yesterday was very interesting, the International Millet, uh, launch of the International uh, uh, Millet Day, uh, kind of unofficial, uh -huh, yeah, year of Millet. And uh, uh, it was good to have uh, Millet Khichdi at the Japanese embassy, <laughs> uh, you know, and Millet Sushi. Uh, I think there got to be a lot more fusion thing going on, you know. Like, for example, I saw recently, there was an ASEAN India uh, music fusion festival, which was held uh, in a very big label. It was all over. You need to do something like that. Uh, and by the way, not many, I don't know how many of you know, uh, even our film stars, like of all the people, Rajni Khan is worshipped by fans in uh, Japan. Japan. Odori Maharaja, this is what he's called. I don't know what exactly that means. Uh, so there is a lot uh, to build on. And that is really important because otherwise... If we keep talking, we are talking about a different Japan than the real Japan of real people living out there. We can take maybe one more yes. round of questions. Yes, please. Well, it is a general question related to Japan. Uh, of course, we are discussing everything in the Japan relations. But it concerns, you know, environmental concerns. And COP has just held in Hermel Sheikh, by the way. My question is, so far as the greenhouse gases are concerned and their emissions in the world, China stands at the highest pedestal emitting around 25% of greenhouse gases, followed by uh, United States around 15% greenhouse gases, followed by European Union about 10% greenhouse gases. And we can also add India. Now, I think it is at about 4% of GIGs, but Japan is emitting only 3% of 
of GIGs in the world. Being highly industrialized country, being a third largest economy in the world, how it has maintained its uh, these deadly emissions, whether carbon or GIGs in the world at such a low level, despite being a highly industrialized country in the world, 3% only. Thank you. A very important point, uh, uh, energy efficiency and uh, green tech, they are leaders and they have a very low carbon footprint. It is something, uh, and I'm sure we have some uh, cooperation going on in clean energy also with Japan. Uh, would uh, Rohan Gautamji, you would like to come in on that? On on, isn't that one more area where they can be? I mean, when sometimes we say Denmark is our you know green tech partner, Germany is our green tech partner. Uh, why not Japan? Well, one of the one of the obvious differences is that we are a highly populated country, and they have a very small population. Uh, of course. In terms of their mass, it is quite a densely populated country also. Uh, they kicked out all the polluting industries, subcontracted it to China. <laughs> so all the, all, the, all the smokestacks are in China because as soon as they realize that, you know, it's getting hard to breathe out. So what they make in Japan is similar to what we make in the hills. We make electronics. We make non-polluting uh, items, high-tech, design. This is the kind of thing they do in Japan. So obviously, it comes down. Plus, with fewer people, expensive cars, great use of public transport, and all that and public transport that is comfortable and, 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 and reliable, uh, they are in a different league. Now, we, we can't. Whatever we do, we build a metro. It's overrun by the number of people. We build a bus service. We put in what we think will be uh, adequate number of buses. It's overtaken in days. So uh, the comparisons are more apt if you talk of uh, China and ourselves than if you talk of the, the big thing that India is doing on its own and quite creditably is the development of alternate energy sources including uh, there was a lady here from Terry Anuj uh, uh, in the morning yeah who 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 uh, was praising the hydrogen development that she went and saw in Japan so alternate sources of energy we have two reasons for doing it one is we're 80 percent dependent on fuel imports which is taking up a lot of our money uh, and putting us under pressure uh, in terms of the leverage it exerts. And the other is the more we are able to diversify some of this ethanol, you know, is these are ways to cut the amount of fuel you're importing. And in the process, you also end up uh, doing solar power and so on, maybe more nuclear power, though it's been in the doldrums forever uh, as the time goes on. And maybe that is how we'll cut our emissions. I don't see getting together with countries with low populations and, and no polluting industries are going to help us all that much. We are still reliant on our coal. Uh, uh, there's just one thing I wanted to mention. You know, uh, Prime Minister um, Modi and uh, uh, Abe-san, they had launched a smart city, you know, uh, twinning. And one of them was had an environmental you know, the Kyoto and Varanasi, um, uh, the sister cities agreement. And you all, nobody can forget uh, Shinzo Abe and um, um, uh, Madam Abe uh, doing the Ganga Aarti in Varanasi, uh, wearing a traditional Indian uh, attire. Now that the smart cities has a component on um, management of uh, vehicular emissions and using technology for better uh, urban planning and all these things. So at some level, we are gaining from Japanese know-how, uh, although it's not directly aimed at uh, climate change, but there is that aspect. Uh, anything else on environmental issues, uh, Manish? Uh, not really, but uh, I, yeah. 
If I may just add to it as a serious listener, since I'm really challenged, uh, one of the earlier speakers also said the foresight of the Japanese is that they have shifted all their polluted uh, polluting industry way back in 1980s. You see the foresight, 40 years in advance, they have shifted all those polluting industry like textile and pharmaceutical and all those kind of things, which were actually creating a lot of carbon footprints and all. So they fitted that in way back in 1980s. That's what I wanted to add to it. Yeah. Thanks. No, very uh, briefly. Yeah. I mean, you know, green technology, uh, the, 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 the government led by Prime Minister Modi has majorly prioritized scaling up uh, production of renewable energy. We've already launched International Solar Alliance uh, and green hydrogen. And all these are major, major priority areas. And, you know, when we talk about technology and funds, uh, Japan is a major country which can play a very instrumental role in that. And I think India will remain very proactively engaged with Japan on this. Uh, under our G20 presidency, for example, there's the energy track, energy transition. So that offers another avenue apart from COP27 and not COP, sorry, COP, you know, then the next year UAE will be hosting. So apart from, uh, you know, uh, working together in Global Climate Summit and other forums, I think these are other areas where we will be working together because we really need that. Uh, green growth is no longer a choice as such. It is a necessity, you know. No, and I just, it just came to my mind that Japan and India, when we are jointly doing projects in third countries, in the Indo-Pacific, we are not building coal-powered uh, fire, uh, coal-fired power plants. We are not doing heavy carbon-based uh, industries or corridors and uh, you know uh, port development and such things. In fact, when we say quality infrastructure, one of the parameters is that it has a lower uh, carbon footprint compared to what the Chinese BRI. Chinese BRI actually has exported a lot of pollution worldwide. Because they're building more and more coal-fired yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, power plants, and um, uh, you know, with with high emissions. Uh, so, right. So we have experts waiting uh, to to take this forward. But I think overall, uh, to go go back to the point about strategic partnership, um, I think it's. Uh, you can't even call it work in progress. A lot has been achieved. And um, you you will recall that we started talking about Japan even during the Manmohan Singh period. But after 2014, the volumes have increased. The investments that have come in have been uh, tremendous. And uh, there is a lot of uh, bounce in terms of the, the quad was revived in 2017. You'll all remember with Japan and India as the two big regional partners. In fact, if you look at quad, I mean, uh, Oceania is, is if you take a technical definition, Oceania is not part of Asia. There are only two Asian powers in quad, and that's Japan and India. And in fact, that was the reason why we were not very enthusiastic about AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, because it has no Asian member in it, even though it's they say that it is for stability in Asia. So I think there is one aspect which was not covered, and I would like to conclude with that, which is the US-Japan alliance itself is not uh, fixed, uh, rigidly fixed in time uh, since uh, World War II. It has also evolved, and Shinzo Abe and the kind of nationalist um, you know, constituency represented, they wanted to break free of a lot of the limitations imposed by the Americans and to have greater freedom of maneuver for Japan itself. And India seemed like the best partner for Japan to do that in Asia and uh, the one with the maximum congruence. So uh, many Japanese believe, and when we talk to them, they say that India has actually given them that, for example, self-defense forces, they were not supposed to do anything beyond coastal defense. Now, over time, through constitutional changes and legislation, they are doing, we have a mutual logistics agreement with them which means that actually we use the military bases of each other uh, effectively, the navies of the two countries. So, uh, and for their self-defense forces to move from a very defensive posture to a more assertive one, they needed India. So I think uh, India does a lot for Japan and they, that's why uh, Abe-san was able to see it so early on. And uh, by the way, we are making an effort to set up a Shinzo Abe Center for Indo-Pacific Studies uh, in our university to advance this relationship. But um, so to conclude, I think there's much that each uh, side does for the other. 
and uh, but there's a lot more and i want to thank uh, both uh, panelists gautam mukherjee and manish chand for giving us some ideas for taking it forward i hope the um, uh, the two establishments on both sides will take note of some of these and i'm sure there are already ideas out there defense technology and joint ventures has been mentioned robotics drones nuclear energy quad plus that's a big agenda that uh, is to be uh, attained uh, joint manufacturing um, narrative of india and japanese business circles need to improve and of course the fta that is being reviewed so there are a lot of nitty gritty if you go in where uh, efforts will go on and i think essentially it's not a exaggeration to say that japan is indispensable to india and vice versa so uh, we are thankful to all of you for having joined this session and uh, let's continue the discussion about the strategic partnership and the next levels thank you very much thank you to panelists and audience now let's just take a short tea break after which the next session will be chaired by dr anita sharma former professor department of east asian studies university of delhi yeah i know i think they've got the heater on <laughs> okay. All of you, all of you. No, I'm a first anyway. But <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. You come and sit here. Because you uh, are important, right? Yeah, yeah, Professor Parvi Guru told me. So, good, ev good evening. After a very uh, warm cup of tea, we are all here once again for the last but not the least this session. Uh, in this session, we have three very eminent speakers. Uh, first, I will introduce our uh, speaker who is sitting right to me, Mr. Amarendra Khatwa. I know uh, most of you recognize him very well, but still I think I will say a few words. Uh, he, as you know, he was in IFS and I know him for the last four decades because we were uh, studying together in the same arts faculty corridors here and there. So it was in like four decades back. So I'm very happy to see you here today. Huh? Uh, so in his diplomatic career, he has held varied positions in the Ministry of External Affairs and Indian Missions Abroad. At the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi, he has worked in different capacities in key divisions that include finance, administration, Northern Division, and Latin American Division. He has also served in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Planning Commission, and Ministry of Industry. 
He has held the position as Director General, Indian Council of Cultural Relations and Dean Foreign Service Institute and also held the post of Secretary in Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, also, he is also a popular poet in his native language, very important, Uriya, and he was instrumental in negotiating a trade deal between India and Japan. So, uh, I request you to please start the uh, presentation and I think presentation is on Japan India trade and so soft power exchanges. Is it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, greetings to all of you. See, uh, lots of erudite speakers, experienced speakers and academics have already spoken. Uh, Ajay retired Babu with 40 years of experience in uh, diplomatic affairs plus India's trade negotiator. Basically, I will add few things. Say, uh, when we are talking about Japan, you know, uh, the SEPA, Indo-Japanese SEPA was signed in uh, 2011. When we signed that at highest level, it was estimated that we will reach a target of 25 billion by 2014 not achieved. Two, uh, whether it is EPA, whether it is trade agreement, we said it will cover everything. Trade in goods, trade in services, rules of origin, uh, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, TBT, etc. Uh, a gentleman was asking the question about why we are not getting the prime green technology from Japan. The six companies which control it, they are not ready to sign with us for transfer of technology agreement. They are ready to sell it as a product. They are not ready to sign the transfer, techno transfer of technology clause. Uh, second, uh, what is Indo-Japanese trade figure today? Uh, while Japan, exports to us about $15 billion worth of goods. We export 6.8 billion, out of which almost 40% are refined petroleum. That is again, not our product, which we get and process in the private sector, whether it is Ambani, SR Group and all, and we export back. Therefore, when we are talking about reaching out in a big scale with Japan, global trade turnover, uh, the reality does not reflect that. What we should do? Say, for example, we struggled a number of years to see that our marine products are exported to Japan. But Japan is a unidimensional country culturally. Why can't we open India uh, uh, marine products mart in each of the Japanese cities with Japanese control? Why should we tell individual exporters from Andhra, Odisha to export? The limitation factor comes there because the marketing norms in Japan is different. Three, Japanese investment outside is almost reaching $526 billion. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we are fifth largest it is almost $38 billion. Uh, some of the speakers were talking about third country collaboration. You know, Japan is very active in almost uh, 43 countries of Africa out of the 65, do lots of projects in water management, in uh, elect electricity generation, in transportation, in civil construction. India does that. We are there because we need the uh, the fabulous vote for um, permanent uh, U, uh, UN Permanent Council membership. Therefore, when we are talking about third country cooperation, Japanese do not understand uh, Africa much. They waste lots of money. They would not be unwilling to go with India. But there is no strategic planning. Why I'm saying this? Because all of us have spoken about it. I'm just talking about the limitation factor. 
as a trade negotiator, I confronted that for about five years. When we signed SEPA, these are the things which are uh, flat. Three, every year, almost we have the highest level summit between India and Japan. As far as Japan, South Korea, Taiwan concerned, these are different countries. They are not USA or European Union countries. Japan is not Nordic countries like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, where in technical assistance, we can get lots of technology. Therefore, the follow-up mechanisms should be absolutely different with these countries. Why can't you have a, like you have a SERPA for G20? Have a SERPA for Japan, Indo-Japanese technical collaboration, Indo-Japanese technical assistance program. Uh, lots of Oriyas are here. You know, uh, in, the, in one of the Japanese universities, they discovered a text which is all, only four year, 400 year old, very ancient text, which is the regional version of one book of the Ramayana of Sarala Das of Odisha. Now, Japanese government has uh, invested 20 crore rupees. They are funding uh, the Sarala chair in JNU, which is the uh, study chair, and they're translating 11 books. When we're talking about culture, if this is there, our approach must be wrong. Despite having Vivekananda Center in Tokyo, despite, despite having 6,000 attendants to learn yoga and all, how come you do not have yoga as a course in all Japanese universities? They are not unwilling. But what we do, we treat Japan like other countries. Here, what you have to do, get the Japanese people, teach them, yoga related things in Japanese way in India, send them back automatically universities will open up. Soft power as far as Japan, South Korea, Taiwan concerned, the route is very difficult to get. It is not 538 AD when we Buddhism was pushed from uh, South Korea and China. Today's Japan after second world war is very cautious in all fields, whether it is trade, whether it is technical cooperation, whether it is religion, whether it is spirituality, they take their time. Therefore, we have to work out a strategy. That strategy has to have a single window mechanism. And that single window mechanism, unfortunately, Ministry of External Affairs, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, they don't have. All the bodies we have set up. If you see the list, say, for example, you are talking about Japan Trust Fund, where you are sitting, like, for example, IIC. IIC, uh, the funding comes from, it started from Japan. Uh, technical cooperation, they are as good as like uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. But which sector you want to take them? If Japan is buying lots of marine products from India, how come Norway, Sweden spend more money of training of our fishermen in Balasore, in Kerala, not Japan? Something must be wrong. What I'm saying, basically rethinking. Um, the projection which most of the speakers have given are good. Uh, we are on the right track. Trade is increasing, but our export is not increasing so much. It is only, as I said, uh, uh, $6.8 billion. And uh, Japanese is almost uh, uh, rest. That is $21 billion. And the services trade, uh, our services trade, despite... Uh, uh, I think who said, money said that uh, uh, 10 students, that's wrong. We have almost 57 students who are working during COVID time, not 10. We have almost 36,000 Indians in Japan. And um, uh, we have learned from Japanese, among these 36,000, we have almost 23 Indian associations. Uh, we fight among each other. Therefore, that also contributes a lot not crystallizing the factors. Uh, and uh, 38,000 Indians uh, as on date. Okay, then, uh, uh, then uh, let me, uh, since last uh, six, seven years, one thing where like our soft power footprint has increased is yoga. Therefore, Ayus Ministry must work out a Japan specific project. We have succeeded in Latin America now. Whether you, you go to Brazil, you go to Argentina, you go to Uruguay, everywhere now yoga is in the university. But IUS has to develop a Japan-specific project. 
Then the Vivekanand Cultural Center, uh, this is a huge cultural center where almost every day, uh, four to 500 Japanese students come to learn dance, music, uh, uh, yoga, everything. But, uh, but uh, long term, for the long term benefit, we must, uh, we have six chairs, we must increase them in Japan. And these chairs should be mostly on either on philosophy or yoga or science and technology. So today, when you are talking about green technology or uh, chips, these are, uh, because as, as somebody has pointed out, because of pollution reasons, Japan has vacated lots of the pollution making industries to China. Uh, notwithstanding that, third country collaboration, third country production, joint participation in projects in Africa, these are some of the elements we must work out in a concrete manner at the highest level, at the summit level, with a clear follow-up mechanism with Japan. Uh, I think I'll stop here. And... Uh, uh... Okay. Thank you very much for this informative talk. Uh, actually, I think he has a meeting. Uh, little deviation. Can we have questions for him now? If somebody... Huh? Because he has a meeting and he will leave. Uh... Uh, uh, oh, uh, another thing I'm forgetting, very important thing. Uh, we are not using that much restoration of monuments. Japan has tremendous amount of funds, whether it is Sarnath, whether it is Saddhara, whether it is Sanchi, whether it is Dhauli, most of the maintenance is being done by Japanese, including restoration. But they are, non, they are also willing for other uh, monuments and all not only Buddhist, we are not using them properly. This is another uh, lacuna in our technical cooperation approach. That's right, thank you very much. So in case we have any question or observation. And what do you think, sir, why we are not catering to that? Uh, why, what what could be the reason uh, why we are not doing that? Since they, they are willing to uh, yeah. restore our uh, other monuments also besides Buddhist, Buddhist monuments, why we are not doing it? Uh, Three points I said, uh, the follow-up mechanism, as far as the Indo-Japanese collaboration go, we follow them like we are doing with uh, uh, India-Kenya, India-USA. I said Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, you have to be specific because the administrative mechanism of the countries are different. That is one. Two, once the summit meeting takes place, say for example, uh, you know Japanese Prime Minister's uh, promise, that in four years, uh, uh, almost $30 billion will spend. Where they will spend? Who will make, uh, monitor them? Commerce is not doing it properly, nor external affairs. Shouldn't we have a Serpa kind of thing I said? Or uh, single window monitoring and follow up? With Japan, I'm talking about. These are suggestions. Uh, such eminent academics, uh, other people have said. But these are the points I'm making. That is the reason. Thank you. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Thank you so much. You referred to this project of translation, which Japanese government is doing. A little more on that and related to that is the whole uh, scope, a lot of scope and the responsibility of initiating a widespread translation project. And for example, and how, for example, this can be related, linked to new education policy. New education policy has a very minimal emphasis on translation. But if we translate more of Japanese work into different Indian languages, so that would create the kind of cultural space for learning culture and... Uh, uh, you see, my friend is here. Uh, the Center for Japanese Studies in Delhi University we are more geared to send our people to Japan than bringing them here. That is one. Two, already we have identified almost uh, 20 to 30 Japanese texts which needs translation. Who will follow them up? Saito Academy does not. They just call somebody, give them an award. After that, it ends. Uh, Japanese ambassador attends all these meetings. I always make this point in Saito Academy. Three, the texts they discovered and they found it like uh, Japan, as you know, they love mysticism. They found a text which is from Orissa, Saraladas Ramayan. Therefore, they got interested. Dr. Udayanath Sawin Jenu is in charge of this. Two universities, 
this university in Japan and Heidelberg, they take lots of interest in translation of Indian texts. They are doing it. Please get in touch with Dr. Udanath Sao. I'll give his address to you. And already um, three books of like uh, Sarada Ramayan they have translated in Japanese and it's selling well. But what I'm saying is building up. Uh, it's not that overnight we can do it. Already many things has happened. The scenario has already been discussed by Gautam Ji, uh, Professor and all that. The scenario is there, but now we have to focus. And Japan needs different kind of focus, like I said, like South Korea and Taiwan. And with our uh, so-called sweet enmity with China, we need to nurture them better. Thank you. Question or observation? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. I assume this Prime Minister very uh, uh, energetic uh, presentation. <laughs> so uh, you mentioning the last point that you were saying that the Japanese give a lot of funding for Sarnath and other the Buddhist sites. So this is on a private level or government level? Uh, three levels they give. Yeah. Uh, one they give to through external affairs to culture. Archaeological survey, it is there. Two, the technical cooperation projects, which is administered by the embassy, ambassador's level, they pick up small projects and alert funds. Third is the private end domain, which also sometimes administered directly, sometimes through embassy, all three. And total, we are just calculating, it's almost uh, 130 million dollars. Just maintenance of Dhauli every year is almost uh, half a million dollars. They are doing it happily. Dhauli, where uh, Osuga came and butchered Odias. <laughs> Good turn of phrase. Huh? Very no, because uh, too many Odias were here. Being a Oriya, I thought I'll tell that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is not the poetry thing. I write in Oriya, English, Spanish, and Hindi. I have almost 40 books. But my dedication of my last book was hypocrisy is my father's name, frustration is my mother. <laughs> when I when I try to live in my poetry, why should you bother? Uh, New Delhi. Uh, he completed his PhD in urban planning from Chiba University, Japan. Uh, he completed master's in planning with specialization in urban planning from School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, and BR from uh, N uh, VNIT, Nagpur. And he has experience of consultancy, research, competitions, and exhibitions in USA, Japan, UK, Mexico, Vietnam, South Korea, Morocco, France, Denmark, Slovenia, and Myanmar. And his expertise is in smart cities, artificial intelligence, and uh, urban regeneration of historic towns. And speaks a bit so, of Japanese also. Yeah, because he studied there. Huh? Okay. To you, uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I, I speak a little bit Japanese, so I will say konnichiwa to everyone. <laughs> and uh, arigato, everyone, that you are over here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I am a professor in School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. Uh, my specialization is in multiple number of fields, and I, I worked in Japan in field of historic cities. Uh, as most of you know, uh, uh, you know Japan is rich in terms of its culture, and preservation of historic heritage and historic cities is one of the very important part of their culture. Now. In city planning, uh, as a city planners, it's very important for, uh, you know, to see even for general public, like how Japanese city planning is very ahead of Indian city planning and how we can actually link this city plannings of two countries. Like we, someone was saying in previous uh, talk, there is like, you know, a sister city concept happening with India and Japan. Uh, not just the sister city concept, there are beyond that we can have a, some kind of a technical collaborations with Japan. We can learn from them, we can use their expertise in India. 
and even we can share some of our expertise with Japanese. Now, as rightly, there was one question like, you know, uh, why we are not having so much of collaboration with Japan and what are the problems? Uh, I've been studying in Japan. I mean, I studied for four years, then I keep on frequently visiting for conferences and, you know, many research work over there. I've been good in Japanese. So I feel like, you know, main problem is like the language. And secondly, rightly sir pointed out the, you know, the communication amongst and the administration. What happens is the Japanese culture looks in a very different way, the administration. Their working is very polite. Their working is very timely. And this quality of administration, many of the other countries don't have. So they find it very difficult to work. Everyone wants in Japan to be on time, not on, you know, even a single second late over there. Their transportation, their everything, even if you are one second late, they feel that this person is not professional. So all these things count when you do, uh, you know, talk with Japanese, when you talk with people. So I will come back to my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I have a short presentation for all of you to share one of my experience of one very beautiful city in Japan, uh, which will let us know like how, uh, you know, city planning in Japan is so interesting and how we can actually find some ways where we can do Japan and India collaborations on some common grounds because we also have a rich history and culture over here. Next slide, please. Uh, I will be talking about, you know, if you see the city of, uh, you know, cities in Japan, uh, Tokyo, which is located in center, and there is a city called Nagahama, which is located in Shiga prefecture. Next slide, please. Overall, in Japan, if you see, like, you know, it's a very small land area, but there are like 47 prefectures, there are like 779 towns, and city planning in Japan is called as Machi Zukuri. Machi means a city and Zukuri means making of city. Machi Zukuri is a kind of a term which is very common and it's a, it's a very important term. Next slide. In case of Japanese history, you know, like before World War, you may be knowing Japan was not that much developed. It was a very, uh, uh, means there were very few Japanese city planning, uh, you know, acts existing in Japan. But after after the uh, you know, Second World War, Japan came with a very rapid city planning norms, acts, and regulations. And some of the new uh, uh, acts were like city planning acts and town planning acts. And in 1960s, there was a machizukuri system which was evolved in Japan, which is a kind of a very effective ways of, you know, like making cities. Many of you have heard of Kaizen theory in industries. Okay, many of you have heard of so many other aspects of Japanese uh, culture and tradition. Same way, Machizukuri is a kind of a planning system. Next slide. Uh, of course, the city planning process is complicated. I will not go into more detail, but you know, uh, the city planning starts in Japan in a variety of way as compared to India. In India, most of you know, we make a master plan, Delhi master plan. That's all is our city planning. But in Japan, it don't happen. Their acts are so flexible that you can make any kind of a plan in between for just one month and create a kind of a development controls and rules in between. That flexibility we don't have. Like say, suppose we have problem of roads in India. We cannot have immediate controls on those roads because we cannot have a regulations and people are freely enjoying doing encroachments over there. So flexibility of city planning in Japan is a very important thing. Next slide, please. Uh, city planning legislations are important. What happens is like when we plan cities, legislations, the acts are the important things which makes our shapes our cities. In Japan, city planning acts are multi number of acts. There are acts which are national level. There are acts which are at a city level. There are acts which looks after the rural areas. Why everyone talks about why Japanese cities and urban areas and rural areas are zero carbon. There is so beautiful cities, so good, uh, you know, landscape all around. No, uh, no carbon emissions because of these acts. Uh, and uh, there are many, many types of acts which actually creates this kind of a complete, you know, a very beautiful environment. Next slide, please. 
furthermore, what happens is there are many number of statutory provisions, which provisions are at, you know, uh, you know, there are two types of areas. Next slide, please. Uh, there are like in Japan, you know, like normally we classify areas in a very simple way, like we classify, you know, residential areas, we classify commercial areas, but Japanese classifies as urbanization areas and non-urbanization area. Non-urbanization areas are rural areas, okay? If you control them, you don't create pollutions, okay? So rural areas are highly controlled under different acts. So people don't invade there, don't sell land over there and don't do you know, any kiosks. That's why the all countryside in Japan is so beautiful. And then there are like, you know, the urban areas, urbanization areas. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are many ways actually Japanese city planning works. I will not go in more detail, but I will bring you to one very good historic city. Next slide, please. And next slide. So, uh, you know, not just the actual uh, legislation works in Japan, but the decision making institutions are also a very key important part. And there are like, you know, prefectural institutions and, you know, municipality level institutions, like we have state and the local area. But there is something more important. All these institutions are, you know, related at a hierarchy in such a way that they can do any project in much more speed, uh, speed, uh, speed than we do in India. Next slide, please. Uh, now, this was just a general introduction, but something what to, you know, think about, about city planning in Japan and India is like, Japan is a kind of like, you know, way ahead of India and way ahead of India, maybe we should say 50 years ahead of India. Uh, Japanese landscape is combined of technological architecture, which is advanced architecture. At the same time, there is like, you know, historic fabric. I will talk about a city which is called Nagahama. Uh, it is located in Shiga prefecture. It's a small town. Uh, I will show you one innovation how Japanese did. This is the location of the Nagahama, what you see on the left side. It's, it's, a, it's a near a Biwaku lake. Uh, it's a very big lake. Next slide, please. Uh, the city is a very small city. It's like of 58,000 people. It has area of 45 square kilometers with 18,960 families. But it has a very beautiful architecture. It is famous for a uh, Hikiyama Fe Fe Matsuri. Hikiyama festival is a festival where, you know, children celebrate uh, kabuki, means children do performance uh, uh, of different, uh, you know, art and crafts. And this is one of the very unique kind of a uh, uh, thing in Japan. And this town is famous for that. Next slide. Not just this, this town has lots of historic heritage, architecture, and, uh, you know, like very significant castles, palaces. Uh, next slide, please. We, which, uh, which actually gives the town a very significant, uh, uh, you know, architectural history. This is the map of town. Now, what happened long time before in this town? There is a very interesting thing what made this town deteriorated or degenerated. And it came out as a very new ideas. A uh, long time before, you know, old city areas were having lots of good uh, vibrant shops, people going around buying things. But because of starting of, you know, lots of commercial development outside the city, the old city area completely deteriorated. Now, citizens of Japan came with very innovative town planning system, and they call it a town planning company. And they call it in Japanese a machizukuri company. And the company, what they develop is with the 11 investors. And these 11 investors came together to revitalize the old town area. This is a very unique system. And in this system, you know, group of citizens come forward and they make the city with profits. Okay. And this kind of innovative models we don't have in India. And that kind of a things which we can learn from Japanese uh, models and we can implement in India. Next slide, please. Uh, you see all these shots, they are showing you how the historic architecture of this Nagahama city is. Next slide, please. Uh, please, next slide, please. Next. Uh, what happened over here was like long time before, you know, like complete old city was deteriorated. Nothing was there, all shops were closed. 
people started finding ways and i said like they just made a town planning company they, they named this company as a kuro kabe company kuro means black kabe means wall what they did is first they started by painting this into a black color japanese believes like you know if they have black color on their walls it's bring fortune and they wanted to bring fortune to this city and they came up with an idea how to actually regenerate city and this company which they developed was having one non profit organization then one real estate developer and then when there is a, another is the business development company and gradually this company started taking one after another empty shops and they started revitalizing and giving businesses to the people local people over there living inside the city next slide please so this is how the you know the company they form it's a very innovative model of you know a company which is formed by a group of community a group of people living in a colony or group of people living in a you know small part of a city next slide please they started you know kind of a collaborating with people's chamber of commerce and they develop another institution called town management organization next slide please now uh, if you see in this maps from 1987 to 2006 the whole all area was completely redeveloped and businesses were given by the company to the various peoples living in that city and gradually not just the company earned the money the local people also started getting money from the businesses they were running and the number of visitors came to came to the started coming to this city and the complete city turned out to be a kind of a museum city and it becomes a museum city and today it is famous as a museum city it if you take a bullet train from tokyo to uh, osaka it you have a station over here you can stop for a weekend and you know enjoy the museum city there are lots of institutional mechanisms they develop and they develop very complex systems next slide please so these are uh, some of the ways they completely started redeveloping or revitalizing the area next slide i will show you some photographs so you will understand how you know they actually revitalize the complete city next slide you can take it slowly okay uh, one by one slide yeah so you see in this uh, uh, please keep on going yeah you see in this photographs like you know one after another the company started renovating the old houses they starting giving businesses to people they starting making museums over there they started making restaurants over there and complete old city area was made back to the life which was existing in the historic time you see all the buildings are colored with black walls kurokabe the black walls which i was talking about the name of the company and you know now today if you go over there in this city it's a very beautiful city with vibrant number of you know group of visitors coming from all over japan with all types of you know glass accessories glass you know products glass studios and so many things uh, which are continuously happening over here this group of kids come here to see, you know learn how the glass art is practiced group of elderly people come here to enjoy the architecture foreigners reach here to learn about the you know history the the hikiyama festival which is very famous over here is one of the very interesting part these are some of the glass studios which were developed by the company in which you know they teach how to make you know glass products so a kind of a museum of a glass which has every type of activities of you know uh, making glass making selling all this and now these products are also sold worldwide now what you see what we learn from here is like how japanese renovate or regenerate their cities in a very short period of time a very interesting model which has not been seen in usa there are some models but in india we don't have this type of models now something what we learn here is very important is like can we learn for this kind of a set of examples for our indian cities you see like when you go to shahjanabad it's such a chaotic area we cannot walk also over there uh if you go to like you know any jaipur you go like we cannot do any you see chaotics oh, all the chaos over there but you know if we develop this kind of a very innovative models please go ahead uh, with the slides 
the city gets employment citizens like this type of people they started making their own businesses over there this they started running restaurants they got employment uh, means i had opportunity to meet all these people talk with them and they told me like how they made the city completely city in a very different innovative model and uh, this is how you know like uh, a kind of a experience of japan in terms of learning how they make their cities can help us help india also to develop you know kind of a new models and develop you know new you new uh, ways to look into our cities uh, most importantly then it comes a question for us like how japan india synergy can be developed with our vision for 2052 i see like you know as a previous speaker has said there are lots of funds for you know restorations there are lots of funds in terms of you know maintenance of this restoration uh, we all can you know utilize those type of funds even in india and we can continue numerous researches with japanese uh, companies and we can find out different ways how they undertake restorations of historic monuments and we can you know develop a very good connection with them many of my colleagues in japan always look forward to how we connect india with different researches so uh, i thank you all uh, i have finished my time so i request you to ask questions <clears throat> thank you very much it was really very interesting uh, to see all this and what is this machi jukuri pura kabe hikikama festival etc and how this is done in a museum city i think we just have one more presentation and then we'll have question answer round at the end huh? so uh, thank you so much praful uh, the next speaker a very eminent one as you all know her very well anu jindal is there she is an artist scholar arts administrator and uh, nowadays she is organizing ongoing series of monthly talks at iac on health multidisciplinary approach including the arts as therapy so i we have seen many exhibitions uh, organized by her in at iac also and other places so we are looking forward to your talk uh, anu ha huh? environment friendly design for sustainable living Japanese role model. Thank you. Uh, before I start, briefly to tell about our charming chairperson. It's my mistake. Her resume is not there in this sheet, which is passed around. So I'll just briefly, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, so, so Anita Sharma is former professor and head of the Department of East Asian Studies and Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Delhi. She's worked as Pro VC at K R Mangalam University Guru Gram for two years. She's written and edited books on Buddhism and Chinese language and has a number of research papers and articles to her credit. it she has presented many research papers in international conferences and she has any number of outstanding awards so i'll just name a couple of them she's been awarded the second world buddhist outstanding award and uh, a, a very impressive one that she's received is the international extraordinary women's award 2020 of switzerland international women's club so that's really impressive so <laughs> so i come to my presentation uh so environment and japanese they go hand in hand because the japanese they love nature it's it's all part of their heritage it's it's in their blood so it's a very valid kind of a you know when you talk of the two and uh uh sorry next slide if you see in their art in their living in their gardens in their architecture everywhere you will see the love for nature the slide at the top left this is a kare sansui or dry landscape garden at rio anji it's very famous where here you have dry rocks and stones and pebbles which are representing nature and in nature they say that the kami resides kami or the soul is there in everything around in nature the mountains the water the stones even the inanimate objects they have kami so how much they revere nature and uh, so so this is all part of their next slide please 
This is all part of their psyche and of their daily living and their thinking and philosophy. The Four Seasons is a very popular theme in their paintings, in their art. And so you go from right to left, like the top uh, left painting. And in, in the right side are photographs actually of the Four Seasons. And in each season, not just uh, the weather, but also the flowers which you see, we all have heard of the sakura blossoms or the cherry blossoms. Uh, those are in spring. And then in autumn, right now, though it will be ending, you have the momiji viewing. Momiji is the maple leaves which turn from green to yellow to orange and then finally to a blood red. So it's very much part of the psyche. It was part of our psyche also. I don't know if it still is. Even we had nature worship as part of this, our society, our thinking. For example, that we worship plants, the Tulsi ji. Uh, you have snake worship, you know, which may sound weird, but it was very much part of our uh, society. And uh, I don't know where along the way we seem to have lost these things. So coming to... What is happening now? I'm going to actually rush through because you see the time is very short. And uh, so now what is happening is that we are developing mountains and mountains of waste and in particular plastic. The seas are getting buried with it. The sea life is getting squashed with it. Uh, not a very great slide, but there's a tortoise who's enmeshed in a plastic bag. And uh, and we are helter skelter. We are cutting down forests to create urban spaces, and we are just not understanding that we need to uh, slow down. I I went for a trek to Kailash Mansarovar, and on the way I passed a village called Garbiang. That was called the sinking village because every year it's sinking a little bit. And there, uh, a, a senior gentleman he told me that we only we try to collect dead wood we try not to cut and if we cut we do it with such a method that it will regenerate so they've calculated it how much do you can you cut so safely so that it will regenerate so we are just not doing that you know and we all have no i presume we all know about how the antarctic and the polar ices are melting the polar bears their habitat is getting destroyed and they are rushing to 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 lower regions and uh, they they don't have enough food and so in so many ways we are destroying uh, planet earth and the carbon emission uh, our carbon footprint is rising water levels of sea are living 17 percent of bangladesh is already sunk i believe parts of chicago city are sunk and they're creating fords like the the dutch make you know the walls against to stop the water coming in so so when are we going to stop you know it's something uh, for all of us to think. Now, Japanese coming back to how their living is so naturally part of nature is one, and they have these sliding doors, which you see on the top left slide. And so this is what we had in our Indian system of verandas. We also had this, and now nobody makes verandas. Everything is about covered space, and we don't even open our windows, and we are sitting in air-conditioned places. And the verandas, or, or what the Japanese are doing, the sliding doors, it's to bring the outdoors indoors. And then, of course, you have the cross uh, ventilation and the breeze coming in. And... Uh, Solar panels have become very popular in Japan. Very many people are going for it and alternative methods of energy. So thankfully in our country also, I'm noticing that we are having a lot of it. I think our Prime Minister Modi is also promoting it a lot. When he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat, I remember him saying at that time that uh, when I look at my uh, uh, state, I see just uh, sand, sand, sand because part of Gujarat is a desert. He says, so how can I utilize this? So make solar panels here. And this way you can generate electricity. So uh, I think uh, over here also we are uh, trying to do. Now, can we go back to the last slide, please? Thank you. So technology for sustainable living. So new technologies. They can help. It, it depends on how you use them. Technology may not necessarily be an, an environment degenerating term. You can also use it in ways to create new materials, which will be environment friendly, which will save costs and will also uh, can also be recycled. Next slide, please. 
So for example, this bag here, it's made from recycled material. Now, I don't know if you know, there's one pair of jeans takes about 5,000 liters of water and so much human energy and resources just to make one pair of jeans. And we just throw it away once we are done with it, you know. Now that those torn jeans are in fashion, but they are deliberately torn. It's not that because your jeans tore that you are wearing them, okay. So, so they come factory made like that. And so instead of that, how about using that fabric in whatever possible way you can? Again, here in India, we had a very good system of recycling. We had the kabadi coming home and collecting our waste and recycling it. But I don't know what's happening now. We're just kind of throwing it. It's too much effort. We just throw it in the trash can. And especially fabric, one should reuse. So here, this uh, these bags that you have, they are on this basis. Now, mate nai, waste not, want not. Redu reduce our wanting also just our desires if we do that even that can help a lot in terms of eco living reduction of carbon footprint energy efficient alternative energy non-polluting biodegradable recyclable if we use all these concepts uh, then it, it can be go a long way now i'll give you a few examples of uh, environment friendly design so this is a particularly interesting one. This is in Tokyo. This is the Pasona firm's office. And uh, the designer Yoshimi Kono has designed urban farm where inside the, uh, the office space, it's in flats, uh, you have, they've actually grown rice and fruits and vegetables. And uh, uh, a part of this produce is used by the uh, the office workers that you have what you see in the bottom right side that grass growing that's actually inside the office that's happening you know so one is it's also oxygenating and then two like I said certain amount of produce is made and third it's a great stress buster it's like we do gardening as, as a stress buster so you know it lowers this all of us are rushing you know the rat race to do better and then so this also helps as an entertainment for the uh, the staff. So uh, the the iconic Ise Miyake, his brand. So now he in his he recently died. In his later years, he wasn't uh, designing himself, so he employed young designers. So Sumura, uh, he had He has propagated the concept of survival, protection, function, recycle. Uh, I've already explained this. Actually, it's just environment friendly. Uh, clothing that he's talking about and uh, uh, Ise Miyake also propagated our very own homespun khadi for us I think it's infra dig to wear khadi you know the days of Gandhiji are gone and I don't know how many of us are interested in wearing khadi uh, and uh, but he uh, Ise Miyake he had a whole show in New York on uh, on the fifth avenue and in the huge windows uh, he had displayed khadi fabrics and garments made from him and the charkha also Gandhiji's charkha and, and the, the most fashionable center in the whole world and he had displayed all that Coming to uh, uh, this uh, interesting new material, this uh, styrene, I think, polystyrene foam with which this uh, dome, igloo-shaped dome dwelling has been made. And it also, you, it's made in pieces and then they're snapped together. So, you know, quick to make, you know, and, and I, apparently this uh, material is also, uh, it, it doesn't allow e extreme temperatures inside, heat or cold and I believe now in Japan it's the norm to maintain temperatures at 27 degrees Celsius that uh, so so that 27 is not very cold you know really you may you may perspire a bit but that is for energy conservation which I think is very sensible now here in India if I go to an auditorium I, in summer I have to take a shawl along because after some time I start feeling cold at the airport also, so many places where the air conditioning is on, they don't seem to have a regulation system. I appreciate that when it gets stuffed with people, it's going to get warm. But then you've got to have some kind of a regulation system rather than overuse electricity like this and, and force us to get shawls in summer. Next slide, please. So this 
Now, to Fukuzawa, in collaboration with Panasonic, many of the big companies, you see, Japan, we all know, for the huge companies that they have, Sony, we all know, and uh, 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 Mitsubishi, and we have so many of their products in our own country. All of these, they have their own research and development cells, and they are working on this, environment-friendly products. So here, this Panasonic has designed a, a very interesting self-cleaning toilet which is made of organic glass. So an unusual concept. Next slide, please. So now from uh, coming to the fantastic, uh, a concept which is very popular in Japan is kawaii, means uh, cute or oh, chochuit, you know. So they love that concept. So yeah, that I don't know how much wearable it is, but to pass the message, at least, it's a good idea. So you have... Uh, the very fantastic design of the solar bra. So this can generate electricity when it gets exposed to the sun, but probably you will wear an, uh, an outer garment over it when you go out. So I don't know how much is going to happen. And then you have the rice growing kit bra. So even more fantastic. So actually it's growing in that, you know. So coming to another Fan, even more fantastic concept is the spiral city, which is in the underwater city. So you see these uh, these fantabulous American movies like Passengers. I don't know if you've seen that because planet Earth is no longer livable. So they're all traveling to another planet and they it's the journey is 125 years. So they're put to sleep for that much time. And then they go and live on that other planet, you know. So this sounds something like that. Because we don't have enough space, enough resources on our Earth. So, 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 so you know, uh, on the Earth's surface. So the designer has designed a city in the underwater. So quite an utopian concept. The ocean spiral, it's by Shimizu Corporation. So this hasn't been made, it's just conjectural. So this is like they, their hype says, utilize the limitless potential of the deep sea <coughs> through a vertical connection of the atmosphere, ocean surface, deep sea, and the sea floor. But when you do this, what will happen to the sea life? The plants, the corals, the, the, the marine life, what will happen to all of them if we invade their space also? So I personally am not very happy with this fantastic concept. I'm happier with this simple one that you have. So Halloween is a big thing, you know, in the big cities, young people love Halloween, 31st October. It's a Western concept, but they love it, you know, because they love fantastic dressing, actually. In, in uh, Tokyo, there's a place uh, called Fashion Street and um, Harajuku and young people they dress up in all kinds of fantastic thing they'll put a like a pirate they, they, they'll put a, this thing band-aid on one eye and really surreal kind of dressing they do and then on, they, on Sundays they come there and they exchange notes okay who's wearing what and who's more fantastic than the other so Halloween is right up their street, you know. So so some this Densu uh, Corporation's team of designers, they designed this trash bag. So it's a very typical that like, pumpkin, no, with the, in which you make the cuts for this uh, face. And uh, so that is the trash bag. So when you go, you collect all your trash in this. You do not throw. Coming to now, I, I'm winding up. Last slide, please. Hmm? The problem of creating a beautiful rejuvenated planet Earth for our today and future generations has thrown exciting challenges to contemporary designers, which they are handling with hopeful vigor. Emphasis of the research will be on design that has high aesthetic value and at the same time innovative, makeable, functional and sustainable. Now, I've just given you a very, very brief introduction. There are ma very many products which are being done. The Good Design uh, Award was instituted in 2011, maybe in India, uh, along with the, uh, the, the Japanese. And Pradyumna Vyas, uh, he was the director of NID. He was in charge of that project. And many of the designs that you see there are very environment-friendly designs. So what can we Indians learn? come back to our own heritage, understand it was all there. In, in our historical heritage, it was there, this understanding of the beauty of nature, the need to conserve nature, to live in harmony with nature. Hmm? So all this, we have to learn from them. And there they make the effort. 
like for example trash there are no trash cans normally on the streets of japan not really you know everybody they have their own bag in their own purse and if they have some trash they'll put it back there and then they'll go home and dispose it off then they do a fair amount of recycling in the in the uh, shops you know in the big grocery stores you have these places where let's say the milk bags or the juice bag you wash them and you come and you put them back there and then for the plastic bags, if at all the carry bags you're taking, you are charged for it. I think it's an excellent idea. If you're charged for it, then you'll definitely get a bag from your home and do it. So, so sustainable living is the message. And I think the Japanese are doing a pretty good job of it. And we Indians, we should also try and look at that role model and try our best also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anu. I think it's very, very thought provoking. And the uh, presentation was really very interesting and also beautiful slides we have seen. And I think we must also try to follow some of these at home also. Uh, now, I think it's already time, but still we can spend at least uh, five to 10 minutes for uh, Q&A round. Any question from our speakers or any observation? yeah what you are promoting is uh, minimalism we call it minimalism and which goes with the socialism but uh, capitalist may not be too eager to adopt it because capitalism is basically on a consumer base more you consume more the job gets generated and they may not be very happy with the minimalism so what is your observation to that no it's an excellent point that you made uh, I think uh, I, my figures could be wrong, but I think Americans, they are the highest consumers of planet Earth's resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then the Western countries, they are telling uh, this COP27, uh, let's say, took place just now at all these environment conferences. They're constantly telling the, uh, the, the developing countries that we should control our use of resources. But if we do that, we are also stimming our growth. So, so we just have to take a tough stand. We're very tough about it and say no. And, and now this new concept is coming up, which I like very much, that you pay for it. The West has already plundered planet Earth's resources. And now they're telling the developing countries, no, you stop doing it. Like, for example, coal. Coal is like very carbon emitting. So, uh, so they're asking us to lose it, le less of it. But then you pay for it. You give us the alternative. So this is a very valid point that you have raised. Thank you so much. Now, in terms of this uh, designing, uh, eco-friendly designing and this kind of examples that you presented, it also has the dimension of uh, cultivation in the sense that these processes that need to be created at multiple domains, like educational space and other institutions, they just do not come in an isolated way. So I request your reflection on about these processes. And secondly, the spiritual dimension. And uh, you know, Japan also has its multiple spiritual roots and also the poetic dimension. So if you could kindly give some example how the spiritual and the poetic are also interwoven with this kind of design processes. Actually, that was all part of my presentation, whatever you asked. And your question is also a comment. It's self-explanatory. So the education, spiritual dimension that you said, yes, yes, it's very much there. It's there in our psyche also, in our uh, system also. And of course, it's very much there. Whatever I said about the four seasons, the fascination with that, the way they, they love nature, the Kare San Sui that I said, all these, the, the Kami residing, in, in every object in nature, that is the spiritual. So it's uh, it's anyway there, and I've already talked about it. And, and education is what I didn't talk about. So that's a very good point that you have made. That if we start young, we catch them young, you know, then, then we'll be able to persuade them. Like there's been this uh, lot of uh, 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 this thing against firecrackers. Diwali especially. And I think little children now, they aren't really using crackers because that they were told in schools. So they could be told in the, in the education system or other aspects also. Yes, I will just add to your question about education, why it's so interesting. Uh, 
as you said, you know, in Japan, uh, small kids right from their schooling days, you know, they are taught about cleanliness. You will not believe like in a school in Japan, kids are even asked to clean their floors by themselves. Uh, toilets also. And this, this, this is not something wrong, but it is something what they are inbuilt in them right from their childhood, maybe three, four years ahead. So uh, these things we don't have in our culture. We, our education system, even, you know, our kids, our schools don't teach them all those things. So the Japanese, you know, like spiritual, the cultural, the educational system, all the language taboos bring all those things in, in Japanese peoples. So that's why they are so different from us and ad advanced in technology as well as, you know, uh, right towards their own cultural requirements, culture. Food, if you see Japanese food, it's one of the amazing food where you can get, you know, a life of almost 100 years. Most of the food which is based on soybean. So the education which is there, if we take it right in a correct direction at a childhood level, it can bring that changes in people. And that is what I feel is a right answer maybe uh, to your question. Professor Pr Praful, there is one uh, uh, question for you. Yes. What about the layout of the garden and the trees in Japan? I uh, found that them slightly different than what we have. The yeah. way they protect the trees. Uh, no, what happens is like uh, you must have heard of bonsai concept. Okay. And the you know the Japanese landscape design concept, when you talk about the layout, Mainly, they are also related to all the spiritual and, you know, the cultural uh, requirements of their own. Now, as ma'am shown you a dry landscape, a dry landscape gives a web feeling of, you know, a kind of a calmness. They call it in Japanese, shijushi. So, those calmness is seen. And the bonsai adds to all those, you know, like concepts. So, layout is generally framed in such a way for Japanese uh, landscape is like, you have a mix of adventures. So suppose like house is there and around the house, there is a complete landscape. So the house is made such an open that it flows with the landscape. Like that's why there are large sliding doors. Then there are, there are those verandas where you can sit and enjoy the landscape and its layout. Then you have like, you know, water as a component where you have, you know, these fishes. Uh, most of these uh, very famous Japanese fishes which are there inside. So all these things are blended in that layout to make a kind of an environment which is very much, uh, you know, make you feel that you are involved with nature and gives you that calmness, that, you know, peace of mind. So the layout is designed with requirements of humans, uh, like the way it is. Thank you, Praful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, audience, for being so patient and for this lovely uh, discussion. Uh, we had very uh, good, excellent three uh, presentations today in this panel, and I thank and congratulate all the speakers. And I think we have already surpassed the time. And uh, now it's uh, to you, sir. Gautam. Well, I, I have been asked to round up the impressions of the whole day. And I must say that as a conference, a seminar of this type, this has been a blend of art and culture, hard economics, strategic thinking, and uh, reflection on cultural differences and cultural similarities. Having said that, I just want to talk about the morning session, which is mainly, uh, you know, online with people in Japan, and some of the things that struck me. Uh, a fairly elderly artist was so full of life and irreverent. He called himself avant-garde. He produced a little dibba in which it was shaped like the moon, colored like the moon. And he said, this stops time. It's, it's a cream. He was charming. He start kicked off. The lady who came after him is a deep practitioner of Bharatanatyam, yoga, uh, uh, 
martial arts. And she was asked, uh, well, what, what is this all about? He said, she said, primitive power. This is what I get from all of this. And all of it, all of this Indian learning is a way to pray to God. She, she, I think, hit the nail on the head and managed to do this. Of course, she's been practicing it for 26 years. Uh, so she's got a pretty good idea and a number of mentors from India. The professor, the ex-professor from JNU was very astute in terms of laying out the economic realities between Japan and India and the, both the progress and the lack of it and why. Uh, he, that, there was an interesting point that with declining population, uh, the Japanese and the Americans are turning quite a lot to the Philippines, uh, to the Filipinos, as opposed to the Indians, maybe because uh, there is more cultural affinity. It's, it's, it's difficult to say. In the next session, Dr. Dhawan, who is from Terry, spoke of Japanese humility, Japanese culture, Japanese cleanliness, a point that keeps recurring whenever you talk of the Japanese. It's almost, uh, from the Indian point of view, uh, fairy tale like you know, because we are chaotic. We, we arrive at our cultural uh, points in a very different way. But we arrive at them, and they seem to appreciate it. The next person who is a... Uh, he's a popular culture expert. And he said, you know, India inspires us as a fountain and as spring. You know, spring as in uh, real water coming out of... Says this, uh, he, he dwelled on a, on, on a very old and badly made, but very inspiring uh, character called the Rainbow Man. Um, who, uh, you know, can do fantastic things and was very popular in 1972, 73. And he indicated in short that India is a cultural uh, honeypot that Japan has been dipping into for 1500 years, both what he called high culture, Buddhism and so on, and popular culture, low culture, and there is therefore a definite appreciation for what goes on between the two countries over there. It isn't as if we are all that alien. Then we come to the next session after lunch. Three people, all three talked of the economics, the security, and the road ahead. I think it was enjoyable and fairly hard 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 reality sort of stuff. Uh, at the same time, it threw up some areas that can be developed and whether they will be developed is the big question mark. But in all probability, they will be because of the joint fate of Japan and India under the threat from China. Then we come to this final session where, uh, again, you know, uh, Professor Katua, Mr. Katua from the government, he said, look, we need to step up and treat Japan as a special project. We can't do what we do with Kenya in Japan. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, these need special efforts, and we should make them in order to bring things up in a manner that both cultures and bureaucracies can understand each other. Dr. Parlekar, who's here, spoke again, in a, in a, though he spoke of city planning and town planning and uh, recovery of dead cities and dead areas and houses he also spoke of aesthetics which is which is sort of 
woven through and through everything that Japanese do uh, to a much greater extent than perhaps India. India has a wealth of riches, but it tends to neglect a lot of it, perhaps partly because of lack of finance and partly because of, you know, when you have too much, you don't really appreciate as much as you should. Uh, Japan was destroyed in the Second World War. So what they have, they preserve and bring back to life to a uh, loving degree. And of course, the organizer of this, of this sort of curate's egg of uh, items, Anu Jindal, who's brought together a lot of thought-provoking things and again, rounded it off with the aesthetics, the art, the culture. I'm surprised nobody mentioned Kurusawa, not once, through the whole thing. And Kurusawa is beloved of every film club. He's been imitated in Bollywood. Uh, he's been uh, uh, imitated in Hollywood. And we do know that one Japanese director rather well. Thank you and good night. Um, basically, you're right on both counts, because one, uh, definitely the threat has uh, provided a catalyst to upgrading the relationship. And when you are upgrading the relationship, you examine each other's virtues, each other's uh, qualities, and how they can be of use to both countries. And so all of that is happening. It isn't really, uh, it's difficult to say which is, which is the uh, uh, cart and the egg, but that's for sure. We've been going around as uh, diplomatically allied to Japan from 1952, but this is happening only now, and I can only put it down to the threat. Thank you. <laughs>